It's a nice thing. It's just um, almost like Senate like. Yeah. Right? A little, a little like Cuba. Yes. No, they actually named it. Hello? Hi. Can everyone hear me? Maybe? Is this loud enough? There we go. Hi, everyone. I'm Kelsey Sibley. I'm the program coordinator for the Riley Center for Media and Public Affairs. Um, before we get started today, I just want to go over a few housekeeping notes with everyone. Um, the restrooms, because I know at some point you're going to be looking for them, are down this hallway to my right, your left, um, through those doors. They're going to be closed the whole time, so you just go through the doors. Um, we will ask that you please silence your cell phones, but we do encourage you to use social media, and please use our hashtags, hashtag John Bro Symposium and hashtag Hacking Democracy LSU. Um, when the question part of the panel begins, please wait for a microphone to get to you so that everyone in the audience can hear your question and so that our panelists can hear your questions. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dean Martin Johnson to get us started for the day. Thank you, Kelsey. Uh, so I'm Martin Johnson, Dean of the Manship School. This year's John Bro Symposium, Hacking Democracy, Technology, the Internet, and Politics, will feature academics and professionals from across the world to discuss how disinformation and foreign interference have affected our elections. After the 2016 presidential election, there's been much discussion surrounding the security of future elections, as well as the use of social media as a tool to distribute divisive and false information. Today's first panel, The Disinformation Effect, and let me just say, what a fantastic <laughs> panel this is. This is really, really unbelievably great. Uh, today's first panel, uh, the Disinformation Effect, the Manipulation of Political Discourse, will be moderated by Dr. Lance Porter, a Manship School professor and the director of the Social Media Analysis and Creation Lab, or our SMAC Lab. Dr. Porter has focused on digital media since 1995, when he built his first commercial website. His research focuses on emerging media, got to turn the page, uh, and power. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Porter to get us started. Thank you. I think I'm using this, maybe? I don't know. Do you guys hear me? I don't know. Is this working? It doesn't, doesn't sound like it. Or maybe I will use the mic. It's on. Check. Yep, yep. How's that? Is that better? You guys can hear me? Okay. Up, up higher? I'm kind of a low talker, so I'm going to go a little higher. Okay, got it? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to read a couple of headlines for you guys. So from the New York Times, chaos is the point. Russian hackers and trolls grow stealthier in 2020. From Politico, why the fight against disinformation, sham accounts, and trolls won't be any easier in 2020. The Atlantic, the 2020 campaign will be a war of disinformation. USA Today, you're going to face a tsunami of disinformation once again this election cycle. And finally, Fast Company, this time it could be worse. 2020 election misinformation will be homegrown and we're not ready for it. So, 
There's a lot of discussion, hysteria, theories about disinformation. We've assembled a panel of experts um, from across the world, actually, who focus in social media, political communications, some specifically focus in disinformation. Um, and we're going to try to accomplish two things with this panel. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to identify the scope of the problem of disinformation in our elections. And two, we're going to talk about some things that academics always aren't comfortable talking about, um, some possible solutions for, for what we see coming up. So um, I'm going to do a quick introduction of everyone, and then we're going to get right into it. We have such a, a large group of distinguished people here today. I've asked them not to prepare presentations or things like that because I want to make sure that we have a really spirited discussion. I also asked them not to talk about this uh, while we were hanging out together today and at dinner last night and things like that, so to keep the discussion fresh. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll have some, some good things going today. So uh, let me start with Andre Brock here on the left. Andre's uh, Associate Professor of Black Digital Studies at Georgia Tech. He studies African American cyber cultures and he's an expert on black Twitter. You just wrote a book on black Twitter that's coming out now. Last week, okay, all right, so really fresh, right. cool. And we have, uh, ya oh, now it's, now it's working, okay. Uh, let me see which one I got. Jacob Olme, Jacob, I'm saying that right? University of Amsterdam, um, he studies the effects of digital media use on political participation, and today he's gonna talk uh, particularly about young people and the future of disinformation. Um, we have Josephine Lakito, who is a, a doctoral student at the University of Wisconsin, and she studies the effects of digital media use on political participation, particularly among younger people. Um, her work was recently cited in the Mueller report. Um, we have Claudia Flores Saviaga, um, who's a Facebook fellow and also a PhD student in computer science at West Virginia University. Um, she studies bad actors and how they organize misinformation and propaganda messages and how other citizens organize to debunk those manipulative campaigns. We have Shannon McGregor, who's at the University of Utah, joining the faculty of North Carolina next year, UNC. She studies a lot of different things, but she studies how the policies and actions of social media companies impact political communications on their site. So she's gonna talk about the platforms today. Um, we have Itai Himmelbaum, who's the director of the C-suite, which is a lot like our SMAC lab here at LSU, but he's at the University of Georgia and he studies social networks and their implications for political communications. We have Jacob Groshek, um, who is the Ross Beach Chair of Emerging Media at Kansas State University. He studies how media shapes the course of political decision making. And we have Dave Karf, who is from, sorry Dave, let me get your bio here. I know, I know where you're from, but I wanna make sure I get this right. Um, he's the Associate Director of School of Media and Public Affairs at George Washington University. He's an Associate Professor there. His work focuses on digital activism, but he also focuses on strategic communication policies of political associations in America with a particular interest in internet-related strategies. And we have Golden Richard, who is our own uh, professor here, um, is a colleague of mine at the Center for Computation and Technology, uh, a professor in computer science and engineering, and also a hacker, right? So, yeah, so, uh, so we have a, a bunch of different types of people, different backgrounds who are coming at this from different directions, and so we want to sort of parse out some of these questions. So first question, I'm going to go to Jacob Groshek. And so can you talk about um, how does dis disinformation look across the world right now? Uh, well, uh, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Porter. Uh, I'm happy to kick things off here and just want to say. <laughs> I'll stand right here. to say, uh, just want to say how happy I am to be here, uh, of course, and uh, part of this panel, which I agree is, is truly a, a, a profound group of experts. Um, in answer to your question, I've studied the uh, distribution, I suppose, of disinformation across three separate campaigns now. And um, with a colleague from um, the Roskilde University in Copenhagen, we've looked at the uh, 2018 midterm elections here in the U.S., we compared those to the 2019 general election campaign in the Danish context. And now we're collecting data, of course, on the 2020 election. And so far we've got ballpark hundreds of millions of tweets about these different campaigns. And what we're trying to examine is the ways that we can look at how disinformation is being spread and by whom across these different contexts. 
And so I've been giving some thought to how I might address this very big question from a relatively, in the scope of things, a small sample size. But what I can say is that we've observed a lot of significant differences from 2018 midterm elections to the Danish context. We saw a much different proliferation of actors who were spreading misinformation in the US, mostly conservative bot types on Twitter. Um, in 2019, in the Danish context, we saw a large group of, of political actors, of politicians who were actually active in the spreading of misinformation. And I don't sit here as someone who is an expert in Danish politics, that is my, my colleague and, and co-author uh, Sander Schwartz. Um, but what we really wanted to identify there is how these different personas and these different user accounts were, were taking up and being morphed into the communication scene. And what is to this is to say, in the Danish context, we found almost no evidence of bots that were masquerading as people, okay? And in the US context, it was dominant. It was everywhere. And in looking at these, these differences, we were trying to identify, you know, how might we actually try to stem the tide of disinformation or misinformation or fake news it takes many different shapes, right? So looking ahead then, we wanted to compare 2020 as a national election here to the midterms, and again, vastly different. Now, I just started to collect some data. We've got, uh, I don't know, 100,000 units or so, so far, just from Super Tuesday, but it is not at all like what we saw in 2018. So as unhelpful as it might be for us to piece together solutions to what has become a global phenomenon, it's fundamentally different, I think, I over time uh, across election types and, of course, uh, looking at various countries. So I think that's probably where I'd like to pause and maybe invite uh, others to comment or to have you direct us a little bit further. No, not yet. yet. Okay. <laughs> what kind of things spread? So what kind of disinformation is more likely to spread? We I think it was obvious to the obvious academic being a <laughs> great Danish critic. Um, <laughs> so, so the question of spread itself is like we, we, we try to always think about sharing type of spread. How many likes, how many tweets, how many retweets. When, and, and, and one of the things that I'm trying to do is actually rethinking the idea of, of spread. And one thing that hits me. Have you all heard about Pizzagate, Hillary Clinton? <laughs> I haven't heard about it relatively late in the game, and I was really surprised because apparently half this country knew about well, this. Quarter of this country knew about it, and I didn't. And I see myself someone who read this news, very informed about politics, and yet I did not hear about it. So coming from um, network analysis approach, again, patterns of social interactions, uh, we, 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 I, I came to s ask, ask myself, okay, we are creating communities where everybody interacts with everybody else, very dense communities, clusters, we call them. And within that, information f goes um, fast, people trust each other, they're relying on the same information sources, but very little information passes from one community or one cluster of users to the other. And that's the experience of a lot of these um, um, fakes, misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, it stays within this community and when they spread out, that's the kind of um, information uh, dissemination that I'm interested in. When does it leave the community of the already convinced people and get to the group of people that are not? So the big answer is I don't know, but the <laughs> smaller answer would be that we have some indications of, of what tends to change. Everything that related connects you in the content to something different than your community. Other hashtags, other user mention, and so on that are not obvious to your community tends to spread out. Um, negative more than positive. Uh, we looked at that both in text and in images, automated analysis there. Um, joy and happy did not go across clusters. Um, facial even in terms of that. Uh, we found that call for actions, which we all know is corona number. I spent some time this morning looking at that. Definitely tends to um, go across. And I had another thing I want to remind myself in case I forget. Uh, oh, yes, and manipulated content of um, 
other sources. So we did some HPV vaccination around that and you find out, very political. I found out that taking CDC condom, you retweak it, com uh, um, um, work with the data um, and uh, manipulate it tends to one of the things that pass along across um, clusters. And as a side note, I said it's also how you combat it because if you understand what come tend to jump from one community to the other, you can try to think about how this information can jump back. Okay, all right, we'll come back to that for sure later on. So, Josephine, would you like to talk about um, uh, Russia's different disinformation efforts in the 2016? Yeah, and I'm really glad I'm actually responding after you, Ty, because I think one of the things I've been really curious about is not just disinformation sharing within one platform, but how messages pop from one platform onto another platform. Um, and we know, especially with the Russian Internet Research Agency, they used a lot of different platforms in the United States. So they were active on Tumblr, on Twitter, on Reddit, Facebook, Instagram. Um, LiveJournal is still quite popular in Russia, and so there were several uh, Russian troll accounts that had LiveJournal accounts. And we know some of them started developing websites, had Google accounts, things like that. And so we know strategically, um, I've done some research showing that it looked like they were test driving messages on Reddit before they were bringing them to Twitter. Um, and so you would see the same message or the same links on Reddit and then about four or five days later, they would appear on Twitter, usually under a different account. Um, and so things like that, I think we, de we definitely underestimate right now, just because we're, we tend to look at a lot of these effects or these spreads within one platform. Um, and I think as we move into 2020, we're probably gonna see a lot more cross-platform strategies. Those were really effective um, with Russia and with the IRA, particularly when they're trying to develop these personas. So if you're trying to pretend to be an authentic American citizen, you don't just have a Facebook page. You tend to have multiple different social media platforms and a, a much more complex online persona. And I think that's what Russia is trying to replicate. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how you identify what what is a Russian effort? Like, how, how, is it, how are you able to distinguish that? From yeah, something? so um, some of my early work really originally relied on social media platforms and how forthcoming they were. Um, some of the work that I've been doing recently uses a combination of computational methods. So similar to Itai, uh, I've found that a combination of network analysis and natural language processing tends to be quite effective as opposed to just using one individually. Um, and so we'll try to find, for example, accounts that look like they are one tend to share inflammatory messages, um, and if they are Russian, uh, Russian, presumably Russian trolls, they'll usually have some sort of linguistic features um, that a Russian speaker struggles to learn when they're um, speaking in English. So those are things such as uh, freeform syntax structure in Russian. There is uh, they're not they're not beholden to that subject verb object structure, for example. Or in uh, the Russian language, there's no copula, so that to be. Um, doesn't exist in Russian, and so we'll look for some of those features, but I don't think that in and of itself would indicate a Russian troll. We would have to find someone who uses those features, shares inflammatory language, and then it's part of a cluster or a network of Russian trolls that are usually interacting with each other um, and interacting with a broader network of bots that tend to primarily retweet that activity. Um, and I think that's one of the really fascinating and kind of scary things about Russian disinformation is they're not just producing content by real people, but then they are relying on these automated tools to amplify those messages further. Okay. Cool. Jakob, can you talk a little bit about how disinformation is affecting young people? Yeah. So um, I think there are two things. Maybe one is a bit more negative, the other is uh, more positive. The first thing is that you have to think about that this whole area of, of disinformation uh, we, we live in right now that hits young people at a special point in time, namely when they develop their political self and also their strategies how to deal with media. Um, and uh, we know that um, they are uncertain in general, like young voters, first time voters have uh, very low vote choice certainty, so they don't know uh, whom to vote for. And a couple of years ago, you could still tell them, well, you use the media, you kind of like form your own opinion and uh, you'll figure it out. And I think this, this has uh, dra dramatically changed. Um, so if people, young people nowadays turn to the media, they basically might not know uh, what to trust for and then they rely on uh, false information um, or as a, as a result, they could also kind of like say, well, I'm not turning out at all in an election because I simply don't know uh, uh, whom to trust. Um, we did a study in 2016 uh, on the Danish uh, uh, national election and there we actually found like uh, 
that um, social media use was uh, pretty helpful to uh, increase their vote choice certainty because then they were kind of like engaging with uh, other election campaigns, uh, campaign activities, and I'm not so sure if that would be uh, the case nowadays. So this was basically pre-disinformation. So in the end, it might affect their political participation and to what we know for now, probably not to, to uh, the good side. On a more positive note, you can also say that because it happens in their uh, um, time and formative years, when you look to, uh, towards the future, they might actually better prepare to deal with that and become more resilient um, on these kind of things. Uh, I looked up a couple of numbers, it's all European numbers, but it's quite interesting that basically when you ask the population who's affected most, they all tell you it's the young people, like uh, they would probably um, yeah, be most affected by this information. If you look at a couple of studies that people in the US run, you can see that it's uh, the older generations who are actually sharing more uh, uh, of the fake news. So um, maybe young people have uh, the better skills already to kind of um, detect fake news um, and also kind of like become more critical uh, about the information. I think what we have to think about, um, and that's a big discussion at least in Europe, is how you can actually increase the media literacy of young people. Um, Denmark for once more is kind of like a, a leading country in that and they have kind of like uh, classes for this in the curriculum in high school and that turns out to be pretty effective. So you have to kind of like I think the young people have the skills as such, but you have to kind of like help them to actually use them for, for something good. And then if you look into uh, the future, we know that every ge generation becomes, uh, um, when they become socialized, this kind of like lasts uh, uh, for their life probably. So maybe disinformation for the next generation is not such a big problem and therefore they can also be kind of like the solution to the problem because they grow up in this crazy times. So Andre, uh, we know that in 2016, there were some micro-targeting toward the African-American community that was really designed to suppress voting and things like that. Um, can you speak a little bit about how um, that community has been targeted by disinformation and, and what, how they're responding? Yes, um, <laughs> but I have to put it in historical context first. Okay. So my research revolves around the study of belief belief about technologies and belief about technology users. And so when I began, became aware of the really fascinating work that a lot of people on these, this panel are doing around disinformation and misinformation, I've been continually struck by how little attention has been paid to the role of disinformation and misinformation for minority communities in the United States. It's as if the, inclusion, the use of social media by foreign actors is suddenly so much more important than the history of centuries of misinformation about black communities and the like. And so while I am aware that in 2016 there appeared to be micro-targeting by um, foreign nationals, particularly the Facebook account Blacktivist, mm -hmm. which was retweeted multiple times, but as far as I can tell had no significant effect on any black voting patterns, I'm much more interested in the GOP's tactics of sending out flyers to black communities saying where they should be voting and what, how if you go vote you'll be snatched up on because you have an arrest warrant or they'll, ca they'll, t they'll uh, uh, doing entrapment for ICE, right, if you, if you approach your voting place, right? And so I try to, when I talk about misinformation and disinformation, I try to put it in this historical context, right? Um, uh, if I, I could go back as far as the lost cause, uh, I don't know how many of you are Southerners here by nature, but the idea that the South uh, lost the war and somehow it, be it became a noble enterprise, uh, and many Southern monuments were erected, uh, many monuments commemorating the Confederacy were erected, not when the war was lost, but in the 1910s, 20s, and 30s, right? So misinformation for the black community has a much longer and stringent history. So when I hear, and this is not disrespect, Jacob, Jacob, uh, when I hear about youth uh, now being confronted with ins misinformation, I think about uh, moments such as the talk. I don't know if you guys saw the commercial, the talk, yes. where uh, uh, this mother had to have a discussion with her child about how the state treats them as actors. Black, black and brown folk have never had the luxury of uh, trusting the information sources that have been promoted to them. So when it comes to foreign actors suddenly uh, in intruding upon um, the political process, I think it's very important that we make sure that we're pointing out that they are intruding on a formerly un, um, unaware, almost ignorant uh, group of internet users, which is white folk, 
right? They do tend to target black folk. There's a long strand of black conservatism. Uh, in my field, we call it the hoteps, uh, <laughs> right? Which are people who tend to believe in really uh, patriarchal, misogynist beliefs uh, revolving around pan-Africanism and masculinity, right? And those folk tend to promote conspiracy theories, but misinformation isn't a conspiracy theory, right? It's simply an attempt to redirect people from doing things that they should normally be entitled to do, right? And telling them that they are, there are cir extenuating circumstances through which they should not be able to participate. And so I'm much more concerned with uh, efforts like Gamergate, right? Uh, which is, I think, one of the origin, the origin stories for the Russian troll, uh, internet research army and others, where Anonymous began to pers impersonate uh, African Americans and social justice warriors in response to critiques of gaming as uh, a gendered space, right? So I, again, I'm, I'm sorry for the long answer, but just <laughs> I try to keep it in perspective that while we should talk about mis and disinformation, we should also be clear as to who's being targeted and what their role in gathering or understanding news was before social media was used to target them in the first place. Great. Thank you for that perspective. Um, Claudia, can you speak to how the Latinx community has been targeted. And yes, of course. Uh, first, I want to put um, comments on something that the panelists on the other side said about this community that appear to be spreading messages online. Part of my research has been studying how political trolls organized and how they were uh, coordinating and participating in the political campaign of 2016 and also during the midterm elections in 2018. And what I first found is that they were not spread. They were part of a community. Mm -hmm. They started to form a community online. So for example, they created their own slang. They have certain terms that they call themselves like deplorables or they have their own political figures like Pepe the Frog. So these were like, I found out that these were like pre big strategies that they have to engage the community. They also created these bots online, which they use to engage the community. So they were like games. So people could like keep entertained in there while they were recruiting people. And after that, what I uh, found is that they created these concrete call to action. So what they were saying is that, okay, you are new to the community, I want you to do this, and I want you to spread this message online on other social media platforms. So they were mainly organizing in communities like in Reddit and subreddits, and they were, um, they were spreading messages on Twitter or Facebook or many other social media platforms. So mainly, the, my point is that these harassment campaigns were, fairly organi were being organized in a specific community, and this community dictated what, what the mainstream message is, was going to be. So if they decided that they were going to target Latinos, then they say, okay, I want to spread these me messages and, uh, in, social, in other social media platforms, so Twitter and Facebook, and they even create these libraries of memes that they just had, uh, people clearly just have to click on the, on the, in the drive or whatever they had it and they just put it in the Twitter, they have the, a, list of, a list of hashtags that they could use, so it was very easy to spread the message online. So um, uh, uh, as Andrea was saying, I also detected that in case of the Latin community, they were spreading this disinformation. For example, there was like this flyer of knowing your rights that was created for that community to know what their rights were if they were stopped by ICE officers. Mm -hmm. So what they did is what they were modifying and photoshopping this, this, um, this image and then spreading false information on other social media platforms. So what I found from that is that they also had a lot of political discussions and in those subgroups with actual politicians or political figures mm -hmm. every week. So every week they have someone uh, invited to their groups to talk and create certain narratives, while other new neutral uh, voices were not doing the same. So what was, what was being happening is that there was this information void that it was being created with only the extreme narratives were being like heard of in the other social media platforms. So I think that it's something uh, very important in, in the sense that it's not, it's not only what it's being said about those communities on, on the other social media platforms, but it's what not being said. Because these neutral actors are being silenced by these extreme voices because their messages are louder, if, if you know what I mean. 
So I think there is a great uh, window of opportunity in this, in the sense that these uh, groups that are pro-Latinos also need to be uh, heard on online and also to debunk this disinformation that we that it's being circulated circulating uh, online by these extreme voices because they right now their voice is not being heard so uh, this is very problematic especially because it's something that happened in mid in the midterm elections and i think that is something that is going to happen in these 2020 elections as well great so i'd like to kind of go in a different direction a little bit um, and talk, ask you, Jacob, about some of the work that you did that looked at uh, Ferguson. It sounds like, you know, maybe I think some of your work has shown that journalists are reluctant to participate in some of these conversations which might create one of these information void kind of situations. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, uh, uh, that is absolutely correct uh, based on what we found in particular around the, the events of Ferguson. Um, we again collected a lot of social media data from Twitter uh, over a period of three weeks or so, um, right after the, the verdict was rendered um, regarding the, the Mike Brown shooting, uh, sorry, the, the, the shooter. Um, <coughs> in any case, um, what we discovered there is that journalists absolutely did not weigh in um, to, the, to the fold, to the fray. And when they did, it was very, um, as Claudia just mentioned, very innocuous, very even, mm -hmm. right? And they weren't loud. And so, and this was uh, something that we thought was really interesting because there would be literally hundreds or thousands of people, users reaching out and mentioning these journalists and basically begging them to weigh in in one way or another and the response was often crickets, mm -hmm. right? right? And so our message in that paper in particular was that this was sort of a call to arms for journalists mm -hmm. to step forward and say, yes, we are colors of, in of information. We separate the wheat from the chaff, but we weren't seeing, at least in that space, on that topic, we weren't seeing journalists really taking up that role. And speaking informally to a variety of journalists uh, in you know, my personal network and things like that, um, the answer, in short, was that they didn't want to somehow be seen as endorsing messages or responding to groups that were fringe or spreading misinformation or things like that because it was a sort of professional hazard mm -hmm. uh, in addition to an increased workload, right? I mean, I think we right. can all appreciate mm -hmm. that journalists are already very busy doing their job, so mm -hmm. to add this layer on top and to say, no, you not only need to report the news and do it accurately, fairly, and objectively, you also need to squelch all of these, uh, these users who are saying or spreading or discussing things mm -hmm. in the wrong way. Um, so, so it definitely, you know, uh, for us it was a gatekeeping question, mm -hmm. right? And what we realized there is that many other activist actors could step in and sort of lead the narrative. And in some ways, you know, I, I want us to kind of think about this as not only a bad thing, which is the way, you know, it, it's being sort of positioned now, mm -hmm. But in many ways, historically speaking, right, we always wanted a journalism, a media system that was of the people. And so at once upon a time, right, I think we can probably all remember, we all celebrated the idea of citizen journalism, mm -hmm. right? That everybody could be their own journalist and they could report on what they saw in real time. Mm -hmm. Now that we have that, we're starting to realize that it's really important that we have good professional journalists who are actually really good at their job, who are not just good at, say, pointing a camera at something mm -hmm. and, and pressing a button and posting. So, so I think there's a lot in the, the process here that, that mm -hmm. of collecting information, uh, of sorting it, of filtering it, of identifying what is accurate and what is not, that would benefit a lot from the weighing in of journalists, but then of course you have people's reactions, and maybe Jacob's work would speak to this um, a little bit more, um, but people who don't trust in institutions like mainstream media or journalists working for, I don't know, the New York Times or the Washington Post, then face another layer of, of actually being believed. So, so I think when we, when we situate, uh, you know, what can be done, to come back to that question, you know, we're not just looking at a technical question here, we're also looking at a question that's built into systems and beliefs and, and personal, uh, personalities, many of whom may be more influenced than others. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'll, I'll leave it with that. Yeah, Shannon. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add to that, though, that um, 
some of my research and others as well would suggest that what's happening is like a non-reciprocal relationship here, okay? So journalists are not weighing in right on Twitter to say like, uh, that's wrong, <laughs> you know, um, or that's bad information, but they are taking from Twitter, right? Um, and again, this is not something that we can say is just bad or just good. You know, um, journalists rely, you know, when I interview them and look at their stories, they rely on social media metrics and Twitter in particular to say like, look, um, this is a thing that's happening. So if there's coordinated activity to make a particular narrative uh, take up a lot of space in Twitter, then that ends up in news stories, right? And that's how things like, you know, the work that Joe and, and other folks have done have shown how some of these IRA accounts ended up in stories in the Washington Post and Vox. Um, because, you know, this is another way that journalists are trying to say, here's what people are thinking, here's what people are talking about, and they're pulling from Twitter for that. We would say maybe that's not great, right? <laughs> when disinformation ends up in there, whether it's through sort of hacking of hashtags, um, through coordinated, you know, activity, or even just, you know, um, uh, sort of more natural organizations of extreme voices and, and a lack of um, a moderating voice sort of coming in. Um, but again, that's not all bad, right? I mean, there are also movements that uh, from traditionally marginalized groups in this country that have used Twitter to their advantage to try and make news coverage more equitable. Um, you know, I'm thinking about the Me Too movement and Black Lives Matter and Twitter has played a huge role in getting those issues covered in the sort of mainstream US press. And so again, I, you know, I, I worry sometimes that we um, think about all of this stuff in a, in a really fervish way of like, it's bad, and it's not all bad, right? There are some really important things that have come from this too. Um, of course, you know, I don't think we would accuse either of those movements of, you know, uh, operating a disinformation, so in that sense, it's not, but you know, we can't just say, well, journalists shouldn't use Twitter, right? Because then that's gonna miss out on, you know, all sorts of other things that I think we might, from a normative perspective, think is good to have different voices, you know, covered in the mainstream press, but, but, all of that shows, though, journalists just sort of taking, you know, from social media without really playing a role in it. Um, you know, the work that some of my colleagues have done in studying just like how journalists use Twitter and who they're interacting with, because most journalists are really active on Twitter, they're really only talking to other journalists, right? And so, you know, they're quite active, but they're following other politicians and they're interacting with journalists. They're not interacting um, with like regular folks, you know what I mean? So they're not having this like reciprocal relationship where they are going into conversations, right, where there might be a void that they could fill you know, between some two extreme narratives that might even contain disinformation. Okay. Let's, let's talk about some solutions. Um, so Dave, <laughs> why is this stuff so hard to regulate? Why, why can't the government step in and say, all right, this is what we're going to do about disinformation? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for giving me the easy question. <laughs> um, so the, <laughs> the fundamental problem is that uh, Facebook and Google cannot solve this on their own. Uh, citizens, we all together can't solve this on our own. The solution to disinformation is not let's all become uh, more miserly information consumers or check every reference. We're not going to do it. Um, fundamentally, the, the problem that we're starting from is that we have a set of regulators that stopped regulating quite a while ago. Um, I attended a meeting, God, I think it was back in 2014-ish, um, with social media companies that had called together political communication experts to help them think through how are political campaigns likely to use digital media in the upcoming election. And the thing that stuck out for me there was these social media companies weren't trying to figure out like how do we develop a product to sell more product. What they were trying to figure out is since the Federal Election Commission already by 2014 was functionally not working, the companies had realized, we guess we have to set the regulations then because nobody else is going to do it. Um, Google and Facebook should not be the ones determining what the rules are for political communication online, particularly in elections. They'll do a bad job of it. But since the Federal Election Commission doesn't even have a quorum anymore, since our entire regulatory state has uh, functionally stopped regulating, that leaves Google and Facebook as the only ones left holding the bag saying, okay, we've got to figure it out. And of course they're doing a bad job of it because that's not their job. They're not the ones who are supposed to do it. So if we're going to regulate our way out of this mess, we need to have our regulators start taking regulation seriously. Unfortunately, they're not going to do that between now and the 2020 election. So we're going to make a hash of it. It's going to be a giant mess because our regulators stopped regulating. Mm -hmm. so, so Golden, can you speak to um, are there, is there a cybersecurity solution to this? Is there something that we so should be considering? I'm not positive that um, 
there are cybersecurity issues, uh, cybersecurity solutions that work now. Uh, but I was taken by someone saying that this information is not here uh, elsewhere. Uh, that that basically there's no cybersecurity component to this information, which um, I, I, that that was enough of an eye raiser that I accepted your invitation <laughs> to come down <laughs> and talk. Um, so uh, I. I the, the problems are hard, and I, I wanted to talk just for two minutes about some of the difficult I issues in cybersecurity that I think sort of mirror some of the issues here. Uh, one, I think we, si we can't simply abandon people to be on their own and try to come up with their own solutions, just like we can't do that in cybersecurity. That said, 100% you know, bulletproof cybersecurity is impossible. And so my students and I, you know, uh, sob every day is our new technique for solving some cybersecurity issues is blown away. Doesn't mean you can just quit. Um, the average user's uh, view of the things that are possible in terms of cyber attacks against their computer systems, I think is largely incomplete because they can't, they literally can't imagine how bad the situation is. So the, 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 the example I usually use is like someone that locks their office and, you know, checks the, the lock the next day and doesn't seem doesn't see that it's been broken open and the alarm is still on and the windows are not broken and stuff like that, assumes that the stuff that's in their desk is still there and untampered with and, and so forth. But, but in, in, in from a cybersecurity standpoint, it's literally like people can reach through the solid walls, tamper with your stuff, and then withdraw their hands and you can't see it. This malware is in all sorts of um, devices that, it, that you know, it's, it's outside, the gra outside the scope of um, of antivirus to scan and stuff, so that so users are really in a mess. So um, I think we do need some information hygiene, uh, you know, training for users. Unless we're just going to say Twitter and Facebook and and other social media platforms are just like we have no idea whether things there are true or not. Um, the, the people that don't want any facts, I think, are sort of on the side for me because I, I'm sort of appalled, I guess, personally at fact that many people don't care about there being a solution to this because they're reveling in the disinformation. I, I, don't, I don't have anything to say regarding that. Um, but I think it is a cybersecurity issue because there are things that can be done. So Twitter is about to roll out. We'll, we'll see how it works out, right? But they're about to roll out some sort of deep fake uh, detection and tagging system. Um, I think it'd be nice for users to be able to, you know, uh, associate some sort of reputation with posts, whether that means that verified accounts, you know, build a reputation system like LinkedIn or something like that, that might help a little bit. It'd be nice for users to be able to see maybe really quickly um, what the first entry was into a, into a system like Twitter for some information that, that's doable without, I mean, someone with five minutes to kind of check on the state of the world is not going to spend 24 hours trying to figure out where this post <coughs> came from. from. Um, my student, um, Ryan, who's sitting here, suggested some sort of auto-troping thing, which sounds good to me. Uh, you know, fake account detection needs to be better. I mean, I, 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 I just, I care mostly in, se in the sense of, of users not being abandoned to uh, having no technical support at all, because I think that's largely hopeless. Mm. I mean, it's a different world than watching Walter Cronkite and judging that probably with 90% certainty he's not lying to you today, mm. right? And, and many people have just largely abandoned mainstream news and are on Twitter and Facebook and getting their news only from there. And, you know, those people are going to make bad decisions that impact me unless <laughs> something can be done. I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah, that's Shannon, would you like to share? Oh, uh, yeah, I was just going to say, like, we, uh, the hard thing is we can't even disaggregate whether people are getting information from mainstream news or social media, right? Like, it's all tied up together. Yep. Um, I think the people that we have to be maybe most concerned about from, like, a um, trying to make sure this whole, like, democracy thing works out um, is people who are opting out of the information space completely. And um, I'm a college professor, and I teach students in a journalism sequence. So we might imagine that people in college who are majoring in journalism are like more interested in news as compared to like a regular, uh, you know, regular person. And half of my journalism students are like, I just like can't, like the news is too much and I can't. And 
I don't deal well with that information. Uh, but you know what I mean? But we can't disaggregate it because a lot of people are just opting out of it totally. And then also some people are like getting their mainstream news and they're, you know, but they're getting it through Facebook and, you know, so, and I know Jakob can talk about this too, but then when we try and figure out where people are getting their news, then that gets all messed up. Because if you open a survey and I'm like, hey, do you read the New York Times? Were you going to only say yes if you get the New York Times delivered to your house in a paper form? Or are you going to say yes if you follow the New York Times on Facebook and like every couple days it shows up in your feed? Or are you going to say yes if you follow the New York Times on Twitter? What if you follow the reporters on Twitter? What if your family shares it? You know what I mean? Like, so that's complicated. So yeah. how do we figure out even where people are getting their information from in a meaningful way so that we can come up with solutions about how to stem the tide of when disinformation and suppressive information gets into those networks? We first have to understand what's even going on. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was like really cynical. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> but yeah. Lance, can I have one more thing? Yeah, absolutely. So disaggregation of, of sources is really important as well. Uh, there's a recent news article out that says that Facebook allows the Daily Caller to vet whether news from NBC and other sources are accurate. And the Daily Caller is definitely not um, a mainstream news source, but the outsized ro role it's been given in Facebook's fact-checking system does make it a, a daily news source. The other part I would say too is that while I am a, a huge proponent of Twitter and other social media, uh, there are 139 million supposedly active Twitter users. I'm not counting bots. I'm largely focusing on the U.S. There are 500 million TVs in the United States, right? And so if you go to an airport, uh, the, their chances are really good that they will be uh, showing content from Fox News, right? And so going back to Dave's point about regulatory, uh, the, the how the government has given up regulation, we should also be talking about the way that the conservative uh, news system from syndicated columnists to Fox News to syndicated radio shows has really pushed the Overton window. Uh, we could go back to uh, Carl Rove and George Bush talking about we're in a post-truth, right? Uh, the president is a decider from his gut, right? He doesn't really rely on truth. And how we, did, we never knew how prescient that would be. Right, and so it's it's a really it's a much more difficult issue combining everything we've talked about bef uh, at, uh, before, but that regulatory impulse needs to start with the ways that our attitudes towards news have changed, not just where we get them from, but the way that news is delivered to us in multiple ways. Mm -hmm. Dave, uh, if I can pick up on that, that that Daily Caller story is one that s stands out to me as well, mm -hmm. because of course, if you leave Facebook to make the decisions, mm -hmm. Facebook is going to decide. We're going to give an outside role to outsized role to the Daily Caller. Mm -hmm. That's because if they don't, then elite conservatives are going to continue to yell even louder that they are being discriminated against on Facebook and call for conservatives in the Senate uh, and in the presidency to regulate Facebook to potentially break them up. Facebook, as a business, fears monopoly, monopoly regulation, mm -hmm. and so as a business, they're then going to take political acts that try to get the government not to regulate them. That's the reason why you don't want Facebook alone to be making all these decisions. Mm -hmm. This is the reason why we still want a bit of a technocracy. We still want to have an FEC and, F and an FCC that can go through these sorts of complicated issues and make decisions as bureaucrats instead of as politically minded uh, business people who are afraid of what's gonna come next. So again, I don't actually know, my, my problem is, I don't know how you rebuild the regulatory capacity of the United States without a government that decides that regulation is in fact a good thing. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem that predates 2016. That mm -hmm. goes back a little while that an awful lot of our government has abandoned the regulatory space. I don't know how to get it back, but if we don't, these problems are just gonna get worse. So we we're left with the platforms regulating themselves. Can you speak a little bit to, what are the platforms doing about disinformation? Yeah. Um, they're trying, uh, you know, to various degrees of success. Um, you know, so we see things, um, you know, there are, I have talked to people that work at Facebook and Twitter and Google, and there are very smart people who work at those companies who care deeply about these problems who are working hard on them. Um, with Facebook in particular, though, if you're not, you know, Mark Zuckerberg or Sheryl Sandberg, it doesn't really matter, you know, in terms of what you're doing or if you're not a friend of Mark's. Um, so stuff gets sort of uh, backed up a bit in there. Um, but they're doing, you know, they're trying, but it's a huge problem, right? So, um, you know, both Atai and Joe were talking about this, like, community detection, right? So how, how can these platform companies are thinking about that too, right? So they have researchers there who are trying to identify what they're, what they're really concerned is, is like disingenuous behavior, right? So like people who are, look like they're sort of gaming what, what the platforms are designed for, which is just to connect everybody and like what could go wrong with that. Mm. Um, and so they're, they're working on that, 
But then that leaves us with this other disinformation problem, which are not foreign actors, which are not bots, right. which are people in our government or people in our neighborhoods you know, that are sharing disinformation. Um, and Facebook has recently decided that they're not okay with disinformation if like I post it, but it's okay if like Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton or a politician pays to post it, then like that's okay. Um, and you know, I'm researched this stuff, so I'm in the weeds about it, but I think to most users coming across these different things on Facebook, they're seeing some disinformation, they're seeing some accurate information, the idea that ads are regulated differently than uh, organic posts is not a thing that regular people, frankly, should have to pay attention to, right? And so that creates this sort of confusing landscape. Um, well, there's research that shows that users have a hard time telling what's paid post and an organic. Yeah, post. of course. I mean, you know, and you know, people have been trying to work on some solutions for those. And how can we, you know, um, develop? Uh, it's even actually uh, the one of the lobbying groups um, who lobbies for some of these platforms and digital ads in particular has been trying to come up with like um, a little logo that you would click that would be like for more information and it would tell you like who paid for this um, because they think there should be some industry wide um, heuristic, right? That like everyone can recognize this symbol. And so they're, they even want this, right? And these are like the lobbyists <laughs> for the firm. So they're trying, but yeah, people are not great at recognizing this. Um, and then we see these tensions, right? So um, even when Facebook says they wanna control um, a, a misinformation problem, right? So um, they had stated you know, several months ago that they are gonna you know, be very proactive in taking down any misinformation about uh, the census, about the US census. But recently the Trump campaign has paid for a series of ads that, um, I mean, it's just like a, a, a crappy ad where it's like, you know, take this survey, right? And they're just trying to collect your information, but they use the language of take the set, take the, they call it like the congressional census or something different. And so it's missing, it, it, that makes you think you're taking the census, but they, Facebook is not gonna take any action on that because it's a paid political ad and they've decided they're not gonna be the arbiters of paid political truth. Um, Dave and I disagree a little bit on this. I, I mean, I agree that in the absence of nothing, somebody has to do something, but I 100% do not think Facebook or Google or Twitter or, or you know, Google subsidiary YouTube has the legitimacy or the capacity to make these decisions about what is truth. Um, I mean, the example that Andre brought up of Daily Caller being you know, an arbiter of truth that Facebook has decided is, is one example of this, right? Um, I don't think they should be. Uh, but in the absence of anyone else doing anything, that's sort of what we're left with, certainly at least until 2020, um, likely much longer. Um, and so there are some people trying to work with that, but they are very hesitant to wade into what they see as the overtly political category. Um, Atai showed me an example when we were sitting up here of searching for the coronavirus, something on Twitter, right? Oh yeah, it's it was the, um, the hair extension from China gives you corona, one of the fake news that come. Um, yeah, and, and you search it, and the thing that shops at Google instead of results, or Twitter, instead of results, is a link to learn more about Corona, go to the CDC. So like so it's actually nice. Yeah, no, I mean so they're <laughs> taking <laughs> actions on that, but I would say that's, you know, I am I study politics, so I think everything's political because everything's about power, and so, you know, but this is not as overtly political, right? Whereas, like, Twitter has not made those same efforts to correct misinformation about uh, voter suppression or, you know, other sort of things that are more like capital P political. So they c there's things they can do, right? We see this as the example, but there's, there's less of a will to do that um, in political spaces for overtly regulatory reasons. You know, as Dave mentioned, um, I talked to people who worked at some of these companies about why did they engage with political campaigns in 2016 to the extent that they did. Um, and first they did so for money, right? So if you are working inside a campaign's office and you sell ads, guess what, they're gonna buy more ads if you're sitting next to them, right? Yeah. So there's a financial incentive. But there was also a lobbying incentive, you know, that they felt like, well, if we can get um, whoever is gonna be the president or whoever is gonna be a senator to have a favorable opinion of Facebook or Google, then they're gonna be less likely to regulate us, you know, when they get into office or as they continue into office. Um, so all of those concerns play into how platforms are trying to tackle these things. Right. Yeah. Jacob, yeah. Yeah. I just wanted one question that, that I have when I hear this. It's kind of like, okay, what are the regulations? Do the platform have to do something? Probably they do and they will, but what can we do or what can anyone else do? Uh, and there's one, one result from, from a survey among young people where the question was why they feel so alienated, if that's the word, or do not trust uh, politicians. And they said, well, that's because they pretend to never make mistakes. Um, and 
to be fair, I mean, Europeans coming to the US watching Fox or CNN for half an hour, you're always kind of like stunned what's actually going on there. But it's kind of like everyone just pretends to, to have not done any kind of mistake. And I think if we would allow people, the, the question is why is misinformation, disinformation so important now? And that's because you have to pretend that you did something uh, or you can do something that you actually can't. And I think when it's not about the platforms and the regulatory bodies, but about what everyone else can do, especially everyone who is on television, uh, kind of like just say, well, we kind of like didn't do that well this time. Uh, that would also help maybe to, to not uh, have the need to, to disinform and misinform. Yeah, to, to Jacob's point, I think um, these opinion leaders and uh, folks who are politicians and news media, because they have this really massive audience, when they share misinformation or disinformation, it's very different from, say, if I share disinformation or misinformation, right? It's just reaching a much larger audience when it's a news organization or when it's an opinion leader. So I think of just um, Surfer Mom, who's an account that Donald Trump retweeted, um, where the original account had said something that said the name of the whistleblower, which is not accurate. Um, but then when Donald Trump retweeted it, it just reached a much, much wider audience. And we found that when, an when, for example, Donald Trump Jr. shares a Russian troll tweet, that Russian troll gets more followers. They obviously, their message spreads a lot further. Um, and I think that there are certain very critical actors, opinion leaders who have, because they have that audience, um, need to be a lot more careful when they're sharing disinformation and misinformation. Yeah, and I wanna jump in and, and make it worse. <laughs> um, <laughs> I promise I'm worse. not super cynical. Yeah. Um, we also know there's some experimental research um, uh, by Emily Van Dune and Jessica Collier that suggests that when these opinion leaders, you know, people in the news or politicians even talk, even like use the term fake news, that it makes then people not, um, not more likely to uh, make mistakes about real news, but they judge more real news as fake. Mm -hmm. So it, it has this sort of cynical yeah. effect. So the more that even you know people like us are up here having this discussion, we might be perpetuating the problem a bit because we're making people more suspicious of all the information they're getting. And to a certain extent, that's good. But like, where's where's the where's the top of that curve, right? Where we're informing people, we're making people critical about media. That's good, right? That we want people to be doing research and thinking more about it and, and questioning things. But there's there's some point, obviously, where it, it's having the opposite effect, where people are like, oh, never mind. All of this is wrong, right? I can't, I can't trust any of this. Um, I don't think we want that, right? And so I think, you know, I think we as a field are still trying to figure out where's that, where's that sort of middle ground, you know, where we're making people critical of what's going on in a good way, but not too critical where they're opting out of the information that's good for them to have to make political decisions. Yeah, and I've to actually noticed a, re a reluctance to uh, even use that term fake news. When Facebook was putting together their solution, they called it false news, I believe. Um, so it's either you and something. I'm just throwing a question, I guess, to, to us all. What about social media literacy? We're going old school. We're teaching media literacy since forever in high schools. <laughs> what about, no? <laughs> yeah. Point, yeah. Literacy is not going to solve our problems. <laughs> it, 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 is a, it is a leaky tail that we will never spin. Ever. Uh, the easiest thing for us as educators to do is to say the solution to the problem is more literacy, Everybody sign up to more of our classes. <laughs> no, it's not going to solve any of the problems. Like but I don't think there's probably a there's not a one cure all. Ever. We, we, I think we were successful at least teaching kids most of the time. So I remember from high school, elementary school, how to separate between um, journalism and advertising. And so in the basic stuff, we worked quite nicely. So why, why wouldn't it work? So this. Why wouldn't do let little me, good? Let me, let me broaden it a little more. The reason why I think it wouldn't work is that w we haven't talked a lot about the effects of disinformation. Yeah, I want to get to that for yeah. sure. So and I think to answer your question, I have to get to the effects first. Yeah. Go for it. Um, particularly within elections, disinformation is not actually all that effective. Right. Mm -hmm. If what we are talking about is the ability to get people to cast a ballot for somebody that they otherwise would not cast a ballot for, we're talking about incredibly small effect sizes. That does not mean that disinformation and misinformation isn't deeply toxic to American democracy. Um, I'm cribbing here by, uh, from a piece that I wrote a few months ago uh, about disinformation, at, uh, uh, disinformation propaganda and uh, democratic myth. The toxic effect of disinformation, I would argue, 
does not happen at the mass, mass level, but at the elite level. Mm -hmm. American democracy has never had a mass public that was deeply informed in the book Your Idea, ever, ever, yeah. ever. What we have had is a set of political elites who behaved as though the public was paying attention and would hold them to account if they were caught lying on air. That's a myth, but it's a load-bearing myth. It's one that has weight because our members of Congress are people who are working in government and people who are working in journalism behave as though if you are found to be lying, bad things will happen to you, ergo do not lie. A problem that predates the Trump administration but has been exacerbated over the past few years is that in the context of all of this disinformation, that mythology and those norms have been tested time and time again. Mm -hmm. and we have found them not to be uh, uh, load-bearing. We have, fa we have a set of elites now who have come to believe you can just lie and nothing bad will happen. You can release doctored videos, and while the New York Times will say that's a doctored video, your supporter class will say, ah, the New York Times is fake news, or they will just attack the New York Times and then keep on going. And what we've learned is the elite who does that will fundraise a lot of money and not face electoral consequence. That is how we get to a point where our regulatory state stops regulating entirely. It is an elite level problem, not a mass problem. And that's the, that brings me back to the reason why I don't think we can solve this through literacy. Literacy, if you like pour all of our time and energy into it, might help our masses be slightly better at identifying disinformation. But it is not going to give us a set of political elites mm -hmm. who once again believe in the myth of the attentive public and behave as though if I am caught lying, bad things will happen, ergo I shouldn't lie. So if we're going to get a government that actually takes government governance seriously, we need to start by demanding more of our elites and not instead focusing on us as masses all just being better and then hoping that it trickles out. So you are again, if I'm recapping and pushing it a little forward, What's is that? that if I'm recapping and pushing a little forward, you say the problem is not disinformation, the problem is truth doesn't matter. Yes, the problem is that disinformation leads elites to come to the belief that, wow, I can get away with anything. That's the problem. I would, I would add to that and say that uh, both composition and library and information science have been pushing media literacy for the last 30, 40 years, yeah. right? And what, what ends up happening is that it's a technical fix to a problem, right? It's not actually a substantive fix because it only addresses that moment when those students are in school uh, it never really addresses the p information patterns and behaviors of their parents, of their grandparents and the like. And so I, I'm, I'm in agreement with Dave here where I think that the problem is more for social media is more an attitude of cynicism, right? Where they don't believe in anything that they're being presented unless it's presented to them by authoritative, and I mean uh, people with who share the same ethos with them, right? That that is the, the benchmark upon which they evaluate and validate news now as opposed to some <coughs> mythical past where we had Walter Cronkite who said certain things to certain people who were bound to believe him, even as there were other publics who didn't have those same commentators that they could trust. So I'm, I'm not sure if that helps. I, I'm more of the line that there is no problem to be solved. What we can do is address problematics, right? So we can make the, we can ask the questions that will enlighten us as to the scope of the problem, but it's not something that's solvable with the technical fix. And it's not something that's new either, right? No. When we think about yellow journalism and just historically yeah. speaking, there is a long tradition of disinformation and misinformation, just because it's on a new platform doesn't mean that it's inherently new. I also think there's probably not one catch-all solution, whether it's regulation or media literacy. You know, there's a lot of different actors. Just thinking of, you know, countries and news and social media companies, political groups, including both campaigns and activists, um, and individuals. And I, there's probably not one solution that fits all of that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's important to keep in mind. I'd like to open it up to questions. Um, You'll raise your hand. We'll get a mic over to you. Don't be scared. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure who this one. Uh, this one will go to. Maybe uh, Dr. Richard. But um, early in the, uh, the the panel, I believe it was Claudia mentioned about how bots engage with the community. Communities develop. And I, I don't know, I may be crediting one of you guys wrong. Could somebody please explain how a bot, which is not supposed to be a human being, but an automated thing, goes out there and engages with a community? I mean, I understand why my cousin uh, 
posts really wacky stuff on the internet <laughs> and why bad actors are you know sitting in an office in Moscow you know doing things but I have no clue how a bot gets from little electronics to the community how does it happen explain a bot I, I can explain that and that's something that we found on reddit that was happening actually someone would code the bot and the bot was a game so for example, they have these specific slang terms like Pepe the Frog or the Trump train or whatever uh, the specific terms they had. So if you, you type to the bot those terms, that worm we, they, the bot would give you points. So we are, f we are just, just playing with the bot to, to, uh, to get more points. So it was like these little games that they have lo all over the community. And this, this way they were like community members with playing with each other who got the most number of points. So this was uh, like a thing that they had to recruit new members and keep them like coming back and coming back because it's like with, the, like with video games, you just do it like because you want to win. Mm -hmm. So they, they did that with all the new members and old members and they were encouraging this ty type of games, not over on, on Reddit, but all the on social media where they promoting this type of votes. Yeah. Uh, certainly on Twitter, I think it's really interesting because uh, there are humans who are sometimes producing the content and then there are often bots who are amplifying that content. And mm -hmm. so even though I try to separate, like I, I always try to emphasize that trolls, human created trolls, human run trolls are different from bots that are automated, but they are related in that they interact with one another. And so with the Russian case, you see a lot of instances where it's real humans who are producing content, but it's bots who are really amping up that retweetability. And when the retweetability is really high and when a, a tweet has a lot of retweets, that might incentivize an opinion leader or a news organization to use that tweet in a, in a different context. And so for example, um, talking to some journalists, they've said you know, they will include a tweet into their news story and one of the rationales for it is if it's very popular and if it has a lot of retweets, even if they don't know if those retweets are coming from bots or authentic people. We can give you some links to um, buy simplified software uh, simulations of your cousin, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would add that Twitter has a long history with bots as well. Yeah. Uh, one of the first known bots on Twitter, or the one of the first popular ones, was an uh, account called Horse Ebook, mm -hmm. right? And it literally just published snippets of poetry every day. But because it was automated, it wasn't an actual person. The, the, the software basically was just told to send this particular string of text to Twitter every day at this particular time. We understand that as a bot. Bots are m much more sophisticated now, but that terminology still remains. Uh, if you think of software programs such as Eliza or Microsoft's chatbot Tay, where they have decisions, to cycles, and loops where they can actually respond to things that you type to them, that's what, that's what people are talking about when they're, when they're mentioning bots. It's not so much a mechanical contrivance as it is a sophisticated set of software that provides certain responses and, as Josephine said, amplifies certain responses, which is actually much more uh, malicious and powerful than simply posting new content. I would add one thing to that too is that um, sort of maybe similar to fake news, bot has become like mm -hmm. a thing that maybe has taken on lots of meanings beyond the very technical you know, term of bot. And I think what it captures though is our unease about like is something authentic, right? Is this thing I'm seeing real or not? Um, and, and so it's sort of taken on this like rhetorical power but we should be, you know, thinking about media literacy, we should be really critical of all this stuff um, because all sorts of actors are trying to manipulate, w you know, sort of what we're seeing in ways that may or may not be problematic. Um, I, I interviewed a bunch of people who worked on the, some of the 2016 presidential campaigns um, and the campaigns would in very human forms try and get certain tweets or certain ideas amplified. So for example, the Sanders campaign in 2016, there was a really active subreddit of Sanders supporters mm -hmm. and they would like, there's not technically affiliated, but you know, they like had a conversation and the campaign would go to the subreddit and be like, hey, we'd really like this thing to be trending on Twitter because we know then it'll get news coverage. And then it would, you know what I mean? And so like, is that a bot? No, it's humans. Is it authentic? Is it inauthentic? You know what I mean? And so I think all of this sort of gets a bit, you know, muzzle up in here in this idea about um, what is a bot and what are we thinking about it? And mostly like, is it a bad thing? And I definitely think that goes back to kind of Shannon and Dave's point about the overall distrust, right? It's not really that disinformation is 
causing people to vote in one way or another, but disinformation does make us more skeptical of all of the information that's out there. And so, for example, when a political elite talks about Russian trolls, we see a spike in Twitter activity where people are accusing one another of being a Russian troll, whether that's for a trolly kind of humorous effect or realistically calling someone out as a troll. Overall, that's really you know detrimental when you're not trusting the person you're communicating with. Other questions? Oh. Hi, I'm Aria. Uh, I was just wondering the difference between a bot and a phishing scam. Is a phishing scam a virus? Ooh. <laughs> Golden, you want to take that? I mean, phishing, <laughs> phishing, phishing scams can 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 be automatically created, or, or like a bot can create those, or or human beings can create them. But they're they're essentially just targeted, uh, targeted social engineering attacks. So where some of your personal information is used to create a convincing email or a website that looks like something that, that you're familiar with in order to steal uh, information. I mean, bot. But Bots, you know, are, are decades and decades old, and and you, you the, the earliest ones, you know, you would interact with a simulated human that would pick keywords out of the things that you typed and sort of parrot questions back to you. It, it's it's you know much more elaborate now than it was if you checked in say 30 years ago. Okay. Dr. McGregor, question for you, actually. Hi. I thank you all for being here. This is really awesome. Um, which company is doing the least baddest at <laughs> being <laughs> uh, with technology stuff? Could you repeat the question? What was it now? Uh, which company is doing the least baddest at being a good partner with least baddest. disinformation? Too stressful. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you for your question. Um, um, <laughs> I think... Um, <laughs> I know, now I'm like, whatever I say, I'm going to get in trouble. Um, I don't know. I think they're all trying. I think, um, at least from, I, I care out. more. I, I'll, I'll echo, huh? Pop out. No, <laughs> no. Oh, okay. Are you going to interrupt me, or would you like me to finish? <laughs> okay, there was a promise that Dave would interrupt me at some point, so just seeing it, this is it, we've done it now. Um, no, I think, uh, at least when I talk to people who work, like, in political campaigns and digital advertising, so the political users, they say Google's doing it the best. Th Google gives them the most consistent messages about, okay, this is what's okay, this is what's not okay, here's why we're taking this down, here's you know why this is allowed up. Um, when ads are getting rejected, so I'm speaking like purely from like the political advertising side, um, because that's what we can sort of know the most about, because it's paid, so there's a record of it. Um, so like the most likely case where we would expect folks to do well. Um, you know, when, when ads are rejected by Facebook, and these are to like, you know, um, digital advertising firms who work in politics who are like the biggest firms, um, there's almost no rationale. They, they get no information about why this particular post is okay and why this particular post isn't, and they're just left to like try and figure it out. So I hear a lot of complaints, you know, uh, uh, about that from Facebook. Um, Twitter has now opted out, although we know that's not really working very well, because um, now they have to decide what's political in terms of issues, and I don't, I don't think they're going to do well at that. Um, so I think, uh, but from what, from what I understand from people who work in in digital advertising is Google's doing the least bad of it all. I wouldn't say YouTube falls under that though. Even though they are their parent company, I think YouTube as a platform has struggled a lot more than like the Google ads, you know, side of things has struggled. Um, but none of them are doing as well as we'd like. <laughs> I just want to absolve Shannon right quick. Uh, Slate did recently did a survey of technologists, academics, practitioners like I'm pretty sure some of y'all have been asked to, to contribute. And it was like, who are the 10 worst tech companies, right? And so if you take a look at the Slate column, I'm pretty sure they'll help to answer your question as well. Thank you. Who is also the worst? No asked me. Who is the worst? I didn't you don't look at it. I didn't even yeah. respond to it because that's just not my, my, that's not my wheelhouse. Yeah, okay. Do you have a question? Um, as you guys have touched on, like, e even though there's, like, bots and, like, outside actors and things, like, influencing our media, it doesn't necessarily, like, affect our voting cycle and voting habits and things. In your opinions, like, what do you, th why do you think that these, like, outside actors and bots actually do what they do? Like, why are they wanting to influence American, like, news consumption? Anybody want 
topic. I could start with that. Um, some of it, uh, Whitney Phillips' excellent book, mm -hmm. Why We Can't Have Nice Things, uh, and mm -hmm. uh, Josephine talked about this as well, and, and I think Claudia did too. There are people who simply do it for the lulls, mm -hmm. right, which is an internet term where they do it because it's funny. And this kind of draws from older internet cultures such as 4chan uh, and the like where they really uh, sought to disrupt people by doing things that would shock and horrify them. But it's calcified, codified into this system where foreign actors have taken on the techniques that were promoted by. So Claudia was talking about the Reddits, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they've taken on these techniques that the 4 channers use, now 8 channers, uh, now gabbers, yeah. right? <laughs> like we could just keep yeah. going, right? And, and codified them into actually being uh, prominent uh, techniques for disruption, right? And so I think I'm kind of sort of answering your question, right? Uh, it's uh, for foreign agents, for foreign governments, I would add, I would I would suggest that disrupting the the governmental power of the United States is a long-term goal for many foreign mm -hmm. actors, right? And it's a one of the easier ways to do it that doesn't require the expenditure of military resources mm -hmm. or uh, uh, soft power. I could be wrong, like I'm, I'm sure, but I, that's how I see it in, in this particular case. Uh, and in many ways, they the ground was laid for them because. The I'm back on the conservative media. The conservative media has shown this distrust of government and media authorities, and so they have an easier path towards disrupting what our democratic process was. As Dave talks about, we don't let our regulators rate regulate because uh, Grover Norquist, say, who wanted to drown, uh, make government really small and then drown it into a bathtub, right? And so there's a, there's a long there's a long streak of anti American anti intellectualism. Uh, American America's own disinformation and techniques that were pr prioritized by these particular groups of internet uh, provocateurs that all lead up to this particular moment of disinformation. Can I just add briefly? So I would agree. I would give you three categories: fun, power, and profit. Mm -hmm. I think those are the first two: fun and power. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons why we also see this stuff crop up, though, is just the raw profit opportunity of. Hey, I can create a, a spam news site, a scam news site, spread a bunch of fake stories, and use those just to make Google ad money. That's you know the Macedonian uh, click farms that we saw in 2016. Some of that was connected to to Russian interference efforts. Some of that was just hey, here's a way that like you can make 10 grand a month. And Google eventually shut that down. Facebook did too, but they were slow to do so because of the power element that they since. You had more of those sites on the on the right than on the left. They were worried that, that they were going to get yelled at it, that they were influencing the election. So they waited until afterwards so that they would get into less trouble with the potential regulatory state. But fun, power, profit, those are your three reasons. Hi. Can I? Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so this one is uh, for Dr. Groshek. We, uh, I'm a student of Dr. Porter's, and we actually read the article, you know, uh, talking about the role uh, that journalists played after the uh, Ferguson trial. Um, so my question is, um, because we see this lack of two-way communications from journalists within the, you know, Twitter sphere, how do we encourage those journalists to step up their role as moderators? And if we can't encourage them, where do we turn to? Well, <laughs> well, first, thanks uh, to Dr. Porter for sharing the article <laughs> with his students and his class. I appreciate that. Um, <coughs> yeah, I mean, when we started that paper, I guess a little bit of context, you know, we were really trying to test this idea of so-called reciprocal journalism, which is, you know, an affordance that, that the platform provides and that it makes possible. And so we wanted to set up a, a critical measure to see if this was taking shape. The answer is it's not. So. Um, or at least it wasn't in that particular instance. And I think one of the things that's important here too is that we need to think about these different topics in different ways, right? Not everything here that we're re reporting on is a universal truth, right? So what th the way it was handled on Ferguson may be different than how it's handled uh, in terms of the election. So for example, and I don't want to get off topic. I, I want to see if I can answer your question adequately. But when we're looking at the 2020 election as it's being played out right now on Twitter in particular, we are actually seeing a lot of journalists, both from the left and the right, actively weighing in and what's happening there. So I don't want to say that this is always the case, but in that particular instance, it, we did see an abdication of journalists in that um, reciprocal activity. So who can we ask? How can we encourage it? How can we, it, I, I, I think the answer has to be, there's some sort of incentive. Um, and I don't know if it's necessarily 
uh, a profit sort of incentive, but based on uh, some of the experiences that I've seen in the way that journalists are doing their job on social media, it's a celebrity feature, right? So it's great to have a million followers, and, and you know, it's, it, it's a way to showcase, you know, how influential a, a journalist can be in the space, but I think working through um, the ranks of not just, um, let's say, the elite uh, journalists that exist out there, the Anderson Coopers, for example, the folks on CNN or, or working at the New York Times, but also at a more uh, local, regional type of level, I think we could encourage more journalists to participate in that way. Um, and then how do we structure that into the daily routines? How do we build it into the workload? I think that comes from an organizational standpoint. Right, and I think there has to be a value that's assigned to engaging with individuals and actors and accounts on social media. And at the risk of you know pushing the the bot question too far here, um, there's a, a lot of instances where we have accounts that are not just bots and not just humans, but humans who will use bits of code to help amplify their messages. So this may be a way that journalists could start to leverage some technology in a way that is a combination of humans and technology that might make their jobs in some ways a little bit easier. But of course, it would have to be a system that's, that's closely monitored. So um, I did you know, wanna put that idea out there as well, the notion of cyborgs working, mm -hmm. humans working hand in hand with technology, um, you know, not just for well, let's say ill, but also potentially for good. And this is a little bit of an aside, but we had a project through the Knight Foundation um, a couple of years ago where we were trying to do exactly this, to find ways to have bots effectively intervene in user accounts that were known to be spreading misinformation. Interestingly enough, Twitter decided to shadow ban our bots <laughs> and <laughs> let the other bots sort of roam free. So. I think there's a big question here that we haven't really addressed, but um, since we, I think, can generally identify that bots can be problematic, and they're not always easy to identify, um, but sometimes it's quite obvious. And, and I always sort of wonder, you know, if Twitter is shadow banning us, mm -hmm. and we're trying, you know, to do something genuinely good, where is the, you know, the impetus? There's no regulation necessarily, but um, where is the impetus, and why is that not taking shape? And hopefully uh, that's helpful. And I'll add really quickly that uh, we've done some work here in the SMAC lab looking at um, communication around disasters, and particularly mm -hmm. the floods in Baton Rouge. And journalists are not reluctant to participate in those kinds of conversations because they're not controversial. You know, right, so they're right. they're more sharing information, providing information in a in a great time of need. They do a decent job of it. Uh, local journalists in in, the, in that situation, but when it becomes something that's controversial or uh, relating to disinformation, then there's a more hands-off approach for sure. So. I yeah, think this is going to be our last question, last question. Okay. and I think I'm going to go right here. Uh, hi, I'm sorry. Hi. Um, so I uh, had come across the someone someone discussing the idea that um, what so when I think of like uh, misinformation or disinformation or fake news or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I think of people sharing things that you know are not true, um, but I had seen people expressing the idea that uh, the, the the thing that you need to be operating on isn't necessarily always, or even most of the time, isn't untrue information, uh, nor is it even falsifiable. It's, uh, for instance, content spread by an account, and the content is, you know, it, it's not like false or fake or falsifiable. Sometimes it's not even like stating facts. Uh, but the idea is that the content that is spreading it and amplifying it and f uh, uh, is the source of it is not who they claim to be. So like, uh, for instance, like an LGBT rights account spreading pro-LGBT like information, but like that's not actually, like the, the account isn't run by somebody doing that. It's something else in, in a way that I don't quite uh, understand at the moment. Um, but uh, my question is, how do you, if, if you're not trying to always just like fact check, if fact checking doesn't work because there's nothing false said, how do you address this problem? It's, it's funny because when back at the early days of the internet, it wasn't seen as a problem. It sounds like the fact that it can be anonymous 
or not saying who you really are. It's pr at least the beginning thing is a way that you can express what you really think without coming across um, um, social um, sanctions and so on. So it has been seen as power, something powerful and, and, and positive. Then it became to the point that people don't take responsibility for what they're saying because they don't know who they are. So I, I think that th the assumption it is neg necessarily negative if you don't say who you really are, we just stand behind something. I'm not necessarily sure if that's always a problem. Um, so see what I'm trying to say? I mean, you could just hire who you are and you'll be feel comfortable saying what you really think. I think, yeah. Oh, I was just, Sorry. no, I think, <laughs> <laughs> I was just gonna also say that, um, and um, I'm gonna look it up so I'm not, uh, not missing it. Um, I think also what your what some of what your question is getting at is like, what's the intent, right? Is my intent to misinform? Was it accidental? Is there malicious intent behind it? Because I think we can only really know that when we know both things about the user who's sharing it and things about what the content is, right? Because something could seem malicious the way I share it and not the way someone else shares it, depending on what the content Misinformation is. Misinformation versus disinformation. Right. right, I mean, yeah, and this is like, uh, Claire, Wa Claire Wardle has this great typology of what we might call those things, and it's not just about the content, but it's about the intent, you know? And so we need to know things about both the user and about the content to be able to answer those questions, right? Of like, what really is this problem that we're dealing with? Um, and I find her typology like really useful for sort of mapping that out. Cool. And I would say that it is, to me, it is still disinformation if the identity is not in real. So for example, a lot of the uh, Russian IRA activity that ended up in news media were actually opinions and not factual pieces of information. Um, and those are a lot harder to verify. And I, one of the things I've been encouraging newsrooms to do is to try to actually not just take the tweet and embed it, but to go beyond DMing them, try to call them or email them and make sure that that's a real verifiable person because otherwise it's quite hard to verify whether an opinion is factually accurate or not. Um, and we do see a lot of Russian trolls pretend to be, for example, black veterans, they pretend to be LGBTQ or queer folk, um, and a variety of you know personas that are American personas that are not real. Can I add one more? One more, yeah, last, you'll have the last word, Andre. Boom. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, so when I first started writing about the internet, uh, I used to talk a lot about ethos. Uh, and I think ethos is still pretty important. Uh, the character that people uh, bring with them to validate the words that they're saying and the persuasion that they're bringing, right? I, think, I still think ethos is super important for online because in many ways, the metrics that we use to determine whether or not a, an account is uh, an, an influencer are driven by, uh, help to establish the ethos of a particular account. So if an account has seven million followers, even if you don't know who those followers are, you assume that that account has something positive to say, right? Uh, one of the things that I love about social media, however, is that it is also, particularly for the microblog Twitter, but other spaces as well, uh, is that it has encouraged a diminution, a reduction of the barriers that we once had to challenge ethos. So I'm specifically speaking from the black community, right? We have church leaders, we have gov uh, political leaders, we have education leaders, and at one point, they either were authorities uh, based on their own context or they were given additional authority because they were the people that the media turned to. And what social media has done has kind of broached that particular barrier and allows people to talk back to them. So not necessarily media literacy in the truest sense, right, where we're teaching people how to be better, but uh, the social media has at least opened up a space where people can talk back and disagree, sometimes violently like the Bernie bros. Oh, did I say that out loud? <laughs> uh, but, but in many ways, it, th there are people who are just as informed coming in to contest the misinformation that has happened, right? The other example I would use for dis slash misinformation, what is the role of Dr. Oz, right? Is Dr. Oz a board certified physician? Absolutely. Is Dr. Phil a board certified physician? No, but they're both bolstered by the ethos of Oprah Winfrey, right? And so when you talk about misinformation, disinformation, it's just as, uh, uh, it's profitable for you to consider who's the source supporting them as well as who's the source uh, promoting the information and then apply your powers of persuasion or your powers of Google research, Wikipedia is your friend, right, to try to find sources where they are actively challenging that information. How's that? Great, thank you. All right, so we're gonna do a quick set change um, to bring our next panel up. I'd like to give a round of applause for this amazing panel and for Dr. Porter.
Can I ask that you please wait until our panelists get into the audience because our next panel is going to have a photo taken up here before we get started. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Hi, everyone. Um, we're about to get started with our second panel, so if I could get everyone to find a seat, please. Um, yeah. <laughs> I feel like I need a, a tinkling glass or something or a bell. Um, Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started with our next panel. Um, Secure the Vote, How Election Officials ensure, ensure Voting Security will be moderated by Dr. Golden Richard, who most of you saw in our first panel. Um, he has over 35 years of practical experience in computer systems and computer security and is a devoted advocate for applied cybersecurity education. 
Joining Dr. Richard on this panel are Louisiana Secretary of State Kyle Ardwin, uh, Vice President of Policy and Programs at the National Election Defense Coalition, Susan Greenhall, and Testing and Certification Director at the U.S. <laughs> Election Assistance Committee, Jerome Lovato. Dr. Richard, Richard, I will turn it over to you now. Okay. So if you hate these questions, it's largely my fault. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question one. In case some audience members aren't aware of the different ways electronic voting works, can you outline a few of the different methods and their challenges briefly? I guess I'll, I'll take that. Is, that, is this on? Um, I, hi, I'm Susan Greenhall. I'm the uh, Vice President for National Election Defense Coalition, which is a nonpartisan, not-for-profit NGO. So we uh, are kind of looking for the best ways for people to vote in a secure, transparent, accessible, and auditable way. Um, so there's, uh, right now, the predominant election technology is uh, paper ballots, which is a paper ballot uh, that you would get looks kind of like a Scantron form of the same thing that you might get um, from an absentee ballot with a little bubble or something that you mark to choose your selection and then that is scanned through an electronic scanner. Um, if you have trouble marking that paper ballot because maybe you're not comfortable doing it, maybe visual impairment or some sort of manual dexterity issues, uh, there's a, a, a provided an electronic assisted device that would allow you to mark the ballot through an uh, uh, electronic interface and then that would print your choices for that ballot. Um, what we're seeing now uh, more commonly uh, being adopted is a new type of technology called a ballot marking device for everybody, which is an electronic interface which uh, people choose uh, their choices from an electronic ballot on a screen like a touch screen or an iPad type of looking like thing. Um, that prints out uh, another ballot card um, in the most prominent BMDs, ballot marking devices that we're seeing today, they print your choices. Um, they don't print out a full ballot that looks like the same one with the little dots. They print out just a summary of what you've chosen and a barcode of your vote, vote, vote choices encoded in the barcode. And then that paper ballot is scanned and counted from the barcode. And then the third option is uh, what's called a direct record electronic uh, machine, which is either a touch screen or some sort of other interface where your vote, is you go to a machine you make your choices from um, an interface directly um, into electronic media, which means it's, it's recorded in digital form, and then it's counted from that digital form, and there is no physical paper record. Um, and that is the most concerning from our perspective as a security-focused fo organization. So I hope I did a good summary. Anything to mm -hmm. add? The, the, the one thing I'd add, this is Jerome Lovato with the Election Assistance Commission. Uh, the one thing I'd add to the direct re record electronic devices is that uh, there are some that do have what's called a voter, vi voter verifiable paper audit trail. Mm -hmm. And so it's not all just pure electronic where it gets stored uh, on, a, on a memory device, but it also prints out usually on a, on a roll tape, a thermal paper, uh, your selection. So you can visually verify that. And uh, now in 2020, almost all states have some form of implementation of that, whereas we couldn't have said this four years ago. Uh, but since then, with uh, the infusion of money from Congress, as well as uh, the recognition that voters want to verify, physically verify that their their ballots are, are being recorded as they put, you know, touch a screen, um, that is more the norm now than it was several years ago, where there were entire states that just had uh, just that non-paper uh, model of uh, touching a screen and it going onto a memory card. Um, so that's the only thing I'd add to that conversation. Good. They pretty much covered it all. Uh, you know, Louisiana uses uh, the DREs. Um, <coughs> it's funny, we don't ever get any complaints about the DREs uh, after elections. We only get complaints by um, uh, organizations prior to. Uh, I think the DREs have served our state very well. Uh, we are looking at the possibility of moving towards a, a paper verifiable um, process and uh, we'll see how that uh, RFP process ends up. Uh, but I certainly think <coughs> that Louisiana has done very well and um, has worked very hard um, to um, provide support uh, to our citizens and provide them with the confidence level that they um, need 
uh, and have for many years in uh, perfecting elections uh, with the DREs. I would remind folks that um, it was uh, after the uh, presidential election uh, between Gore and Bush where there were problems with paper ballots and the federal government funded efforts to go to electronic equipment. Um, and now, um, because some people didn't like the outcome of the 2016 elections and they believe perhaps it was stolen, um, that they want to move away from it. So um, in essence, basically, you know, many states have done, um, have had both combinations and have had good experiences. Um, some not so good. I think it, the more you use paper, the more you have a possibility of finding ballots, uh, such as Broward County in Florida. Uh, so you just have to be careful, and I think it's a balance of what the will of the people is, is which, we're, what, which is what we're looking at, um, and how folks uh, in each state are comfortable in um, uh, using uh, their right to vote and which uh, technologies they use. Okay. So before the... Um the topic that we discussed in the previous panel fades away. I have a unrelated question. I think maybe the public doesn't perceive this correctly in some uh, cases. What's the bigger problem in terms of nation state actors interfering with US elections, uh, disinformation, or actual tampering with voting proxies, and why do you think so? Well, oh, go ahead, Dr. Mayor. Yeah, thank you. I, I think by far it's uh, disinformation. Um, I think that what uh, foreign actors were able to do to the um, uh, American electorate in 2016 was mislead them uh, down the path uh, to question whether or not uh, their election processes were uh, good uh, and whether or not the election's outcome was what they um, had intended. I think that there was a lot of um, um, sort of, um, I'll say, basically, we went in a, the direction of attacking what we used in terms of election equipment when the real issue was what did the Russians and others do to attack the political process. They hacked into the DNC and the RNC and to candidate sites. They hacked into the psyche of America and tried to drive us downward into a spiral of not believing in uh, our ver the very basics of democracy, which is our election systems. And so what that drove us to is then questioning the very equipment that we use that we didn't, that we didn't question prior to that. Um, so I, when I speak to groups, I'm asking them to focus on what are they, where are they getting their information? Is that a trusted source of information or are they simply just taking in whatever social media is throwing out? Um, are they taking into account um, robots or, or dot bots or whatever they're called these days, uh, fake identities on Twitter and on Facebook. I think that is where the real danger is in this process and there's not enough focus on disinformation and misinformation versus how we actually conduct our elections. I, I would just like to add that I think there's um, uh, another side to the disinformation discussion um, that can directly impact this our part of the discussion here, which is we see sometimes people putting on uh, Facebook um, uh, that Republicans vote on one day and Democrats vote on another day, or this polling location has closed, or um, it, you show up and you have any par unpaid parking tickets, you won't be able to vote, this that sort of disinformation. So there's other, um, there's ways that that disinformation can also uh, be directed at trying to keep people at from actually showing up at the polling location. And, and in regarding to about the um, voting equipment and hacking of voting equipment, I, I've been in this space for, uh, hard to believe, but well over a decade now. And when I started uh, working in, in elections, uh, my manager handed me a Colorado law and uh, voting system manual and said, go ahead and test it. And we had our testing requirements. I'm from Colorado. And, and uh, as, as time went on, I got more active in investigating complaints. So uh, some of you may have, have seen or heard about, I voted for one candidate and the machine's flipping the votes, it's flipping the votes. And so I got a lot uh, involved in a lot of those conversations. And um, when doing just really simple investigative work and showing the uh, competing candidates, what's happening, and showing them evidence 
they're like, okay, it's not the machine, right? It's sometimes, most of the time, it's user error. Uh, there, there were times when, when certain devices had uh, calibration issues on their screen, and it's just as simple as recalibrating a, a, a touch screen, as uh, those of us who used to have Palm Pilots know. You had to calibrate when you fired it up, and it, that, it was that kind of technology where uh, you would get instances of people saying, I voted for, for Obama, and it keeps voting for Romney, or vice versa. And so when it comes to 2016, uh, as both Susan and Secretary said, is that it was mostly with the information uh, element, not the actual technology, that, that uh, there were issues. In fact, um, in my space now at the federal government, I have to give ourselves a plug because a lot of people don't know about it, uh, especially for local election officials, is that if there are anomalies or malfunctions with voting equipment at, a, at an election office, the local election official it has the capacity to report that to me, actually directly, through uh, a, a form that allows them to say we had this issue and this happened. And, and so then it falls on, on me and my team to do that investigative work. And so that's something that has always been a part of our program. We test and certify voting systems for the federal government. And, and that's an element we're trying to just broadcast more to the general public and especially to local election officials that they have that ability to, to report that up because a lot of times what happens is that if an issue arises, um, they'll just brush it off because someone will help them do something. Like for instance, the screen calibration issue is that that could be a real problem with the technology if you have to recalibrate every two weeks, for instance. Yep. And so, and so we want, we're getting more involved in that element to say it looks clean coming out of a lab, because that's how voting systems are tested, and a really pristine environment. Uh, they're not throwing all these crazy scenarios at it. They're set things that they have to follow. Uh, but as it goes with any kind of technology, I mean, we see it with our day-to-day -day consumer uh, technology. You get a phone, um, it needs updates almost immediately the second you get it out of the box. And, and, so, and so voting technology is no different than that, in that it does have its technology. It's going to have just normal issues that you wouldn't find in a pristine environment. And so um, to, to kind of calm the, if any kind of fears about the voting system itself having issues, even at, in, in all of my years of working in this space, I've seen very, very, very few times when it was actually truly a uh, severe malfunction. And I've seen scanners blow power, power supplies and not count, so. I if I I'm could add to that, sorry, oh, yeah, sorry, if I could add to that, you know, in the, uh, when you're talking about testing, and I know there's two individuals, particularly in the audience, um, one who's worked in the elections um, community himself and the other working for the Attorney General's office who was um, working, um, worked with the Board of Election Supervisors. You know, Louisiana is very particular in, in uh, how we do things. And every, prior to every election, every machine is tested with the Parish Board of Election Supervisors, which is five members, the clerk, the registrar, uh, gubernatorial appointee, a DPEC, Democratic Paris Executive Committee member, and Republican Paris Executive Committee, also with my staff. Absolutely every single machine is tested top to bottom to make sure that that machine is operating properly. Um, and, and to make sure of that, it's a public meeting, candidates are allowed to attend, the press is allowed to attend, and the public's allowed to attend. And I think that's an important distinction. And then when the machines return, um, after uh, the election, then that, par that same board, along in a public uh, setting, each machine is checked top to bottom. Um, and there's a printout of the results as well as the cartridge results. So we, we very, very meticulously go through this process and I just didn't want that to, to, um, to escape us. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. I, I just wanna also, I guess, cause I'm sitting in the cynical chair um, that Shannon had last time, um, push back on, on some things because um, uh, Voting machines are, as you know, Jerome was talking about, it's technology, it's computers, and computers can have problems. Um, and not only can computers have problems, computers can, uh, they can have software bugs and glitches, they can also mal and malfunction, they can also um, be maliciously infected. I loved the analogy you used in the last panel about um, a computer is something that it's like you look at from the outside of a, of a locked room and you think the room is locked and y you think everything is fine inside, but a uh, hacker can actually basically put their hands inside and mess around with things and you can't know. The problem with when you talk about 
using computers for the voting process, the voting process is, is a particularly difficult um, uh, process to, um, to audit and to ensure is being counted correctly because the voter is decoupled from their vote. You can't go to your election official and say, did you get my vote for so-and-so? And that was that how it was counted. If we were to all raise our hands and say who wanted um, like vanilla ice cream in this room, we could count the number of votes for vanilla ice cream and we would all know that the result was right and I would know that my vote was counted right and you would know your vote was counted right. That's fine if you're doing a non-secret ballot election, but when you start to have a voter cast a secret ballot, which needs to completely decouple from, be decoupled from their identity, now you have a very difficult challenge that how do you know that that voter's vote is counted correctly when you're counting it in uh, electronic media, in computers, which have these fallibilities. And that's why um, our organization advocates for a physical record of the voters. Uh, intent in the form of a paper ballot, ideally one that they can mark themselves, so that you know that that's how they voted, and then to use um, some sort of form of an audit to, to check at the end of the night. Um, and I, I would also um, uh, just say that I think it's important to um, to remember that that um, we need to trust the process. Voters need to have confidence in it, and just um, saying this black box has counted your vote well enough and good is is really in our democracy, I think insufficient. I think we need to be able to show everybody your vote was counted correctly. We've done um, a meaningful audit afterwards of the paper ballot, that artifact of your vote intent, and we know that the computer counted it correctly. Want something else? Well, I mean, I, I guess I could <laughs> refute that a little bit further. Um, the quickest way to, um, l for someone to uh, be disenfranchised with a paper ballot is someone to take a pin to it. You can mark it and boom, the, the board's got to decide um, in a challenge situation whether or not that ballot should be counted. And I'll, I'll give you a, just a really frank example. When Louisiana had um, a U.S. Senate race and we had 24 candidates running for the United States Senate, I personally, when I was first assistant, I was working that election and I was helping scan ballots. The worst thing that we could have done was promote paper ballots during that election because what happened was voters did not understand that there was that many candidates for the U.S. Senate race and they marked every column. They lost their own vote for the United States Senate because there were that many columns because there were that many candidates. You know, we, it, we have a uh, open primary system, so anybody can run. And so you can't just knock people off just because they aren't with a political party or there's multiple candidates with a political party. You'd have to go to a, a, a closed primary system in order to fix that, that situation. Um, and when you believe that everybody who wants to run for office should have the opportunity, well then, you know, that's the system you end up with. And when you also have multiple constitutional amendments, the voters actually got fatigued because that ballot was actually, I believe it was 14 pages long, uh, 14 different pieces of paper, and they quit voting. Um, and so constitutional amendments went without significant votes um, because of that. So paper is not always the answer. To me, that's the technology of the 1800s. Um, I think that we can find a middle ground in this, and uh, Louisiana is working on that. And I know that other states who have, went, have uh, paid for solely DREs, they're moving to the VVPAT option uh, or addition to those machines. And uh, when we get through this RFP process, I think we'll have a good complement um, in the middle, somewhere in the middle. And, and I, I have to uh, voice my support for both uh, because I have seen issues in, in live elections. There was a contentious county clear, clear uh, race that I got involved in investigating where's the vote flipping issue, but also um, what happens with, with paper, because uh, this is right in line with both, is that um, every state is unique in how they, they uh, work on duplicated ballots. So if you hand mark a paper ballot, right, and you, you choose your candidate and you're like, oh, not that one, and you, and you cross out and said, I meant this one, and you point an arrow, uh, the optical scanner may not, the scanner may not catch that you circled, I meant this guy, and see that as an overvoted ballot, which would mean that your, your vote doesn't count at all. Um, and if you happen to have technology that has du digital adjudication that says, that flags, oh, this is an overvote, you have 
usually bipartisan judges that say, oh yeah, they meant this one because it has this big arrow that says this guy or this lady. Uh, so in this situation, uh, Colorado does mostly paper and the duplication board was there and I was examining ballots and the duplication board was uh, duplicating ballots with pencil and on the ballot it says black or blue ink because the device they were using, the scanner they were using, may or may not have picked up pencil. I, I know that because I physically tested that system years back. And so I pulled the county clerk aside and I said, you have to get rid of these pencils. Like he, he was on the ballot, it was a closed contest, and at that point, I don't, we couldn't go back to, to count how many ballots were duplicated with pencil. <laughs> and, and, and were they or were they not counted? We still don't know, right? And so, so there are arguments for and against both paper, and as the secretary said, it's important to find the mix there because you can easily, and there we see it almost every election cycle because when, when ballots are mailed in or come through a, a mail drop box, humans still do handle the ballots, and if you don't have security procedures in place to monitor that process, it's not that hard to have a pen and say, I don't want this guy to win, or hey, they didn't fill in this one at all because it's a 14-page ballot, I'll, I'll mark this one. And, and that happens, and sometimes people get caught, and most of the time not because of other security measures that aren't in place. And so the, uh, the, there are arguments for and against both, both types, and I think it's important for election officials to contemplate both and do what's best for their constituency uh, because ultimately that's what matters the most. Uh, what's unique about U.S. elections is that every state has their own way of, of voting and the, the things that they're accustomed to. Uh, and um, at, from the federal perspective, I believe that's something we have to respect um, and, and, and not you know, throw down a hammer and say, this is the way it should be. And I, I think a lot, of other, a lot of other politicians and obviously secretaries of state feel the same way. Uh, but there is, there is a fine line there and it's, it's complicated. It's not as simple as saying, let's just do this because that's the solution. Because uh, the fact is, is that's not how, how life is when, when it comes to actually voting in elections. More different stuff? I, yeah. I can keep going, so I'll, 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 I'll have to shut up. This, yeah. Yeah, we could have yeah. debate all day. So. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so electronic voting includes not only vote tabulation that's performed electronically, but potentially online voting. Do you think online voting is viable, and will it ever be viable? Shall I start? Sure. Okay, no. Online, vi online voting is, is not viable. Um, unfortunately, we do have uh, over 30 states in the U.S. that do allow people to vote over the internet for military and overseas voters, um, but every computer security expert um, you can find every, uh, the National Academies of Sciences, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, um, the Association for Computing Machinery, are all in agreement that we're not able to securely vote over the internet at this time. Um, uh, unfortunately, we have these states that are allowing people to vote um, by email or fax. Um, uh, I don't know if people are familiar with the DEF CON Hackers Conference in uh, Las Vegas. Um, it's a conference where hackers get together and hack different things and there's a voting machine village where they get together and hack voting machines too and see what they can do and uh, last year they did, uh, I had been asking some uh, friends of mine that were there if they would do a demonstration hack of a ballot sent by email and nobody wanted to do it because they said it's too easy, it's not really that interesting to them and I said please, you know, please and over dinner some guys said okay and then they texted me, they were at a party, and they said, okay, we, we did it. It took us like 28 lines of code. And the next day they showed a ballot, they had a, a, a sample ballot um, that had a one page with a person's signature on it. Attached to it was a, a ballot. It was, um, had come from a state that the person had um, volunteered to use, sent it from one email address to the other, and where it looked, where the, the little square should have been filled out for one candidate, when it got from one email address to the other, the other candidate fil been filled out. So there's really um, the possibility of the, these ballots being manipulated in flight um, undetectably. 
um, uh, the Department of Defense has uh, did a study many years ago about it and said that fundamentally the problem is the structure of the Internet is just too porous and insecure. There's just too many different ways to get into it. And um, uh, until we can secure it, we are, uh, which is probably going to be um, quite a bit of time, uh, there are some innovative ideas of having end-to-end -end verifiable voting, which means you can audit it in a meaningful way through cryptography, which I won't bore you about going through it, and, um, but uh, that's probably a decade or two off. I think this is where Susan and I will agree. Okay. Um, we okay. definitely <laughs> should not have online voting. Uh, I don't, we don't have to go very far. In 2008, Finland um, threw out their election because they, um, they could not verify it, uh, and it when it was done online. And additionally, just in 2014, uh, France conducted an online election, and they had problems with that as well. I think you, you're asking for trouble if you are trying to um, vote online. I think we see all the various cyber attacks that can occur. Um, and, uh, you know, a vote is just too precious for every individual and should always be counted um, um, when it absolutely can be counted. And um, I would be afraid that uh, too many people's choices would, uh, would be um, trapped and captured and uh, changed. Um, you know, it's just something that we shouldn't uh, focus in on now. Um, certainly, I'm sure there will be some sort of technology in the future. Um, the important thing is uh, for Louisianians, uh, our voting machines have never been connected to the Internet. They have no uh, capability of um, being connected to the Internet, and either by Wi-Fi or any other means. Um, additionally, um, we're focused on that in this next um, process of new technology as well. Um, because th that's been a key to um, our success with, uh, with our voting machines. Um, none of the equipment that, um, that um, programs our machines are ever connected to the Internet. Um, when we purchase new um, uh, equipment to, um, to uh, program our voting machines, we wipe it clean and we reprogram it only to do the things that we um, know it needs to do to program our voting machines. Uh, so we feel quite safe in the process that we have in Louisiana. Uh, the, the only thing I'll say kind of is that it's like Facebook, it's complicated. Um, only because uh, election officials have limited options for both delivering ballots to uh, military and overseas voters and also the re, uh, receiving those ballots. You know, if you're in the battlefield as a soldier, uh, it's not like you can just put a uh, ballot in the mail and hope it gets counted somewhere. Uh, you know, so right as it stands now, with technology and and uh, you know that that group of voters is that, uh, and I've heard this from different people, both at DoD and, and either uh, and, of, and other secretaries of state, is that w what do you do about this, right? Because if every vote really does count, how do we disenfranchise uh, the 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 men and women who sacrifice their lives for these freedoms to do this, um, and Ultimately, a little bit of that, if not a, a lot of it, happens when uh, they don't. We're not in a place yet to be able to pro provide them a reliable way to cast and verify their ballot from their locations ar around the world. And, and and so it's it's not I'm, I'm it's not I'm not a proponent of online voting, but I'm just saying is that there, there, we have to figure out a way to 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 help them out too. If I may uh, add to that, um, so we will send uh, a military uh, or overseas ballot um, via email, but it's a secure link by which they receive the link and then they download their ballot and then they fill it out physically um, and uh, then they return it by snail mail. Um, and we give um, them extra time for their ballots to be returned um, and to be counted in the process. Okay. Yeah, if there was wild enthusiasm for online voting, I was going to drop the mic and leave. So <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted you to let, just wanted you to know that. And nobody said blockchain. N that's, <laughs> I, 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 I deliberately did not introduce that question. <laughs> yes. Um, so related to attacks, so it seems that y you guys don't have any direct evidence with, um, with actual elections being, you know, hacked by foreign powers. I'm, I'm familiar with the DEFCON stuff, and it's terrifying, right? Um, 
Uh, what role does hardware and software diversity play in preventing future um, attacks? Meaning, are, is it better to have multiple hardware platforms and software platforms or one homogeneous? Are you afraid of having one homogeneous platform? Um, uh, we, we have a homogeneous platform in Louisiana, okay. um, and that's actually served us well. Um, we prevented ourselves from being sucked into the state's um, process of IT um, um, consolidation, and I think that served us well um, because elections is so specialized. Um, but it, it helps that we have homogeneous equipment for early voting and homogeneous equipment for election day so that all voters, wherever they are, know that what types of machines they're using. For example, um, I can see us moving in the future from um, voting only in parish during early voting to being able to vote in any parish during early voting because we have secure sites, we have T1 lines, um, and it's a real-time process. But election day, because there's so many different sites, um, we don't have um, electronic um, capabilities in every uh, precinct, and so we utilize the, the paper rolls um, in order to protect uh, from any problems, and I think we've seen some of those problems just, this, um, just recently in California and in Texas uh, with regards to long lines um, for those issues. Um, but I think what we've been able to do is perfect a process that we've been able to protect both on the parish level and on the state level um, and then um, by network segregation um, protected also the transmission of results on election day. Any advocates for diversity? It's, it's an administrative nightmare, but. I, I would say it's a double-edged sword because um, uh, it, when you have a state-run system like here in Louisiana, there can be higher levels of control. You, maybe the state has more resources than the individual counties so they can have um, uh, better sophisticated technicians taking care of the equipment and protecting the security of it. Um, and when you get into counties or parishes um, that are maybe smaller, uh, less resourced, um, it's gonna be harder to, to, to secure them. What we're seeing in a lot of um, the rest of the nation where the elections are run on individual counties, if they don't have a lot of money, they don't have a, a dedicated IT professional, um, they, may not, they may have one that comes in two days a week or they may have none at all. Um, so let alone a, a, a dedicated um, sec a, a security professional. Mm -hmm. um, and so what also happens is you see the outsourcing of the critical election administration functions like programming the voting machines to um, read the, the ballots and the, can uh, and the votes, tabulating them and reporting them to um, small uh, outsourced third party vendors, which are um, not well secured as well. When we, we look at them, they're sometimes like in mini malls and don't have a high level of security around them where you would want to see. We're talking about mission critical um, infrastructure, right? This is the running of our elections, the very foundation of our democracy and our government. Um, so when you have these small counties that don't have a lot of money and they're sending these critical processes out to these um, small vendors, that can create a whole other problem. So. Um, I think it could go either way, is my answer. <laughs> and if I may, I, I'll, I'll, I'll tend to agree with Susan on this as well. I think what, um, what we've experienced in Louisiana is what um, Susan was just uh, describing. Um, and, and the concerning part is that I'm pursuing legislation on this issue. Um, you have local governments um, who are less secure because of resource issues. Um, they're utilizing what's called what we refer to as MSPs, managed service providers. And in many cases, uh, you don't have to go very far. China has targeted these MSPs to actually get to their customers because they aren't at the level of security um, because the, the attacks have grown more sophisticated and they've actually made their clients uh, more susceptible. Um, and had we not segregated um, the election processes in the clerk of court's offices, then we could have seen a recent attack um, really jeopardize um, our elections, um, or at least the appearance of our election returns being uh, proper. Um, so I was really pleased that we had done that two years ago, but this is a growing issue, and I'm sure in, in, in your world, uh, um, Professor, that you've seen, and your, your concern is growing, is that we just 
when you are dependent upon vendors, outside vendors, you're dependent upon whatever level of protection they have for your own protection. And that's where the jeopardy is. And you've just, um, you've, um, you've foreshadowed the next questions? <laughs> and and, that, and, and um, I was gonna defer till the next one, which is, uh, well, I guess I'll let you ask it for the, <laughs> the panel, um, which is what about supply chain issues? Uh, this is uh, across all governments, federal, state, local, uh, across society, which is supply chain. And, and the work that's happening in uh, supply chain for voting system is as DARPA uh, gave funding to, uh, to do research on developing secure hardware, uh, secure processors uh, that could eventually and hopefully be implemented into voting systems uh, because they're in a global economy with the supply chain, uh, you can have in one, one device uh, parts that come from all over the world, uh, Taiwan, China, Russia, Mexico, I mean, US, it doesn't matter. Uh, and so what do we do about this? You know, uh, if, if you're getting a firmware chip that's coming from China, they can easily install anything they want on that. And, and this happens even it, with big companies. I was in a security meeting last year where a, a big corporation discussed that issue where they, they, they had firmware that came from a foreign government and through some analysis through another security firm, they recognized, hey, you have this residing on your firmware. Um, and and in, in our world of elections, uh, as it was already talked about, it's not like we have this dedicated source of, of professionals to look at every single thing that is part of a, a motherboard, for instance. Uh, and so that is a concern, um, for sure one from every part of federal government. And as we learn more about how, how can we regulate this, what can we do to verify, uh, that's all still part of the discussion and work is being done towards that end to, to provide that transparency and the confidence that uh, no matter where inf uh, parts are coming from in the supply chain, uh, work is being done about it. Uh, but then also regarding the, the third party vendors, uh, which some states have really good regulations and, and support around that and others don't. And it's, it's, it, it's really up to uh, election officials, government officials to, to tackle this issue and say what can we do uh, to, to vet third party vendors? Uh, what kind of regulation is happening at the state and federal level uh, to, to ensure that the, the players in this market are legit and not uh, trying to get inside information or do an inside attack. Uh, because as it, as it happens in some places, I can, I can have a little uh, Best Buy Geek Squad shirt and walk in and say, hey, I, I know you don't have a lot of money, <laughs> but I can, I can help you out with your, with your technology. And it wouldn't be that hard to, to just appear as a trusted individual and have uh, different intent. And so uh, that is a concern and it is one that, that is being addressed. It's just as it goes with, with technology, it's something that you just have to do, it's do with time. It's not like you can just wave a magic wand and it all goes away. And I think, if I may, I think uh, additionally to that, you know, having a strong partnership with our um, our federal partners, the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI, um, and others the na um, on the state level, the National Guard, and particularly in Louisiana with the Cyber Innovation Center. I mean, that has proven to be a very strong um, uh, defense, if you will, because the exchange of information is critical um, for us to learn um, the sophistication of these attacks, um, the issues about um, uh, the um, chain, supply chain, um, and, and those issues uh, surrounding that. Um, additionally, what I would focus on or add to this discussion, I should say, is that um, the exchange of information from entities that are sustaining attacks is the quicker information is um, uh, provided to your local governmental entities, for example, in Louisiana, the Cyber uh, Security Commission, the, e the better it is and the quicker we are all are to react to those attacks. Uh, and to, um, to learn from those attacks and to be able to be prepared in the future. Thank you. I, I would, um, so to address the supply chain issue, um, 
that's a problem, that's a bear of a problem across all parts of government. Nobody solved the problem. I'm right. sure you, you probably deal with a lot of the three-letter agencies and know that. Um, it's a problem for DOD, it's a problem for the NSA, um, and it's a problem in the election community. Um, it's, there's no, nobody's got a solution right now. Um, in cybersecurity, um, people talk a lot about resilience. Now, you're not ever going to make any system 100% secure. You can't make a computer secure, I've been told, unless it's at the bottom of an ocean. I don't know if you agree. Probably not even then. Probably <laughs> not even then. So you want to have it resilient. And in, in, that, in this context, it means even if it's attacked, even if it's somehow compromised, it can still function in the way that you want it to. So if we have an election system and we want it to be able to still function, even if it is compromised through some method, through a vendor, through a supply chain, through some other um, way, um, which unfortunately, because they're computers, they can be, um, even if they're not directly connected to the internet, because there's other ways that, that computer systems can get uh, uh, compromised, that you, if you have, um, and I'm, I'm gonna sound like a advocate, because I am, uh, a paper ballot, um, and that is used then to audit the election results. If you tar start to see anomalies, then the paper ballot can be used to correct any incorrect computerized result. Um, so resilience, and this has been um, discussed in the Senate Intelligence Committee um, and the House Intelligence Committee as uh, the best way to provide resilience in election systems and, and the National Academies of Sciences and so, so forth is um, by y recording votes on paper and then using them to audit the election afterwards. And that's really kind of, I think, the only way to tackle the supply chain problem, which has no solution in sight. So I'm going to condense a few of the questions to open up some time for the audience. Um, and because you've already an answered some of those issues too, uh, maybe sort of my left to right, starting with Susan. Um, you you can you can do anything to the current uh, electronic voting systems and w wave your magic wand and get your wish to make it better. Go. Uh, that I I just um, basically described it as that we would make sure that everybody's vote is recorded on paper, that they verified, and that all elections are audited. Um, before they're certified, so and that if there are anomalies, that the audits are designed so that they will automatically um, escalate to um, protect the uh, elections, to I mean to to potentially correct any incorrect result. W wish list item. Oh, my wish list item. <coughs> well, I, pr I pretty much I, I like the system that we have now in terms of the top to bottom. Um, all the processes are followed by each parish. Everyone knows exactly what's expected of them and how we're going to accomplish that. Um, training, I think, is important process because uh, I think the number one error that can occur in um, any election process is human error. Um, and then the last part, I think uh, we've reached the, the middle ground. So um, through this next RFP process, my hope is that we have both um, a computer uh, uh, component as well with a paper component for the audit process that, that Susan was discussing, although we do do a significant audit process as we have now. But uh, for the comfort of voters, I certainly uh, agree that a paper component is uh, important to the process. Uh, I would like to see the, a step up in, in providing uh, better accessible technology for, for, for voters. Uh, what I mean by that is we have paper, and there's a talk about paper, but actually having it verified by people that have accessibility needs. You know, so it's, it's one thing to say, here's a paper, piece of paper, I've counted on it, but how can I, if I have uh, a disability, be able to verify myself independently that that is what the paper's recording? Um, you know, and as it stands now, uh, there are, aren't really any good systems that do that, so that would be at the top of my wi wish list is, is upping our game with, with providing reliable accessibi accessibility technology when it comes to voting. Okay, that's good. Final question before we let the audience attack you guys. Um, starting with Susan again, um, just a basic idea. Are we worried enough or not worried enough about elections in general? Or the election I don't, process I don't in ever like to advocate for worry. Okay. I'd like to be, are Rephrase. we proactive enough or not proactive enough? And I would argue not proactive enough. I think okay. there's been a lot of advancing advancements made in securing things like voter registration databases, which was essential and wonderful um, 
uh, and there's been information sharing, there's been uh, cooperation with the Department of Homeland Security, there's, uh, that's great, um, but the, there's been, uh, there it's, there's an understanding that we need to have resilience in our systems, that we can be able to reconstruct what happened. Um, the, the Iowa app, the caucus act that failed, the reason that they didn't, everything didn't go for naught is because they had paper records that they could go back and reconstruct because the, the app failed. So um, I think we need to be really focusing on building resilience into our election systems and um, uh, we are not there yet. I would say the Democratic caucus in Iowa failed because they didn't have election officials involved. Um, I think when you have election officials involved, we don't have a safety net. I, if something goes wrong, I, I'm it, you know. Um, but I think that we, we, have, we are working uh, and going in the right direction. I think all of these dialogues uh, year in and year out uh, with secretaries and other election officials has been um, poignant and I think it's been um, um, helpful to all of us to look for ways uh, to adjust our systems, uh, to make changes where necessary. Um, you know, right now, my staff is working on how do we conduct an election in the midst of a coronavirus epidemic? You know, it's not the machines themselves that's going to cause the problem. Are people going to be afraid to go to the polls? How do we get um, participation? How do we protect our commissioners? Are we going to have commissioners if there is an epidemic? Uh, there, there's so much that goes into uh, conducting an election and everything around an election and inside the processes and procedures. And uh, what most people don't realize is this is a 12-month out-of-the-year process, regardless if there's uh, an election only once each year, uh, except in Louisiana, of course, we have four per year. So um, we're always working, um, looking at our processes and procedures and looking for ways to improve. And I think you'll see that this legislative session where we have numerous pieces of legislation to address various issues. And, and I, uh, I think the strength of our elections is our election officials. And so when it comes to worry or not, I'm, I'm not worried. Uh, I've, I've had the opportunity uh, both locally in my home state and throughout the country to meet election officials and, and work alongside them with different things. And the election officials are people like you and me. They, it's a job. They, they care about their job and doing well at their job. And as the secretary noted, they're the last line of defense. It all falls on them uh, to, to, to ensure that our elections are run properly. And I have confidence in our election workers. And I think we all should, as Americans, do that as well. Uh, obviously, there are people that have different agendas and different things that, like that, but when it comes to uh, what we put our trust into, it's ultimately people, because they're the ones who sign us in when we go uh, register to vote. They're the ones who put a paper ballot into a scanner. They're the, they handle everything that we do. Uh, and so when it comes to worry or not, I, I'm just not, because I know we have, that, that is our strength, is our local election officials. I think we're going to open it up to audience questions, and I will be right here. I got a couple questions for you, federal folks. Um, Sorry, what'd you say? The federal people. Um, 2016, we were talking about the trust in the process. I believe our president said uh, there were three million fraudulent votes cast in that election, and then. The Federal Elections Commission had had a quorum since our president got elected. Is there a reason for that? Well, our, our agency, the Election Assistance Commission, does have a quorum, um, and and it did even in in, uh, in 20, uh, 16, 2017. Um, there were there were a few months, uh, a year and a half ago, when we didn't have a quorum, but but since then we have. And as far as the the claim about three million uh, fraudulent voters. I can't speak to that. Uh, there, w there wasn't any deep dive investigative work to prove or disprove that, that I've seen. Uh, but that's, that's all I can say from, from that level. Do you think that's even possible? <laughs> uh, uh, I'm not gonna comment on that. <laughs> he asked if it was possible, well, anything is. Um, so that's all I'll say.
So I know one of the big issues with Super Tuesday is there was a really low turnout for early voting. And so I just wanted to know what can Louisiana officials do to increase early voting ahead of the election, especially in densely populated areas, to reduce those wait times on April 4th? I was just on the radio uh, this morning and, and yesterday, and uh, we talked about uh, wait times that other states were experiencing. Uh, we constantly analyze um, our elections in terms of wait time and um, lines. Um, I think what, what we found is uh, even with over half a million people voting early in the last gubernatorial election cycle, uh, we did not have long lines. We were very quick. Uh, to check in folks, uh, and uh, the ballot was such that, uh, the machines were such, I should say, uh, that the screens were so large, much larger than previous um, elections that folks were able to see it better, use it more quickly, and, and be out and get their I voted stickers. Um, so we, we've been really pleased with it, but we continue to analyze it. And what most people don't realize is that we allocate voting machines on election day by the number of registered voters in that precinct. So um, if there's an increase in that precinct, then we'll increase the number of machines uh, and decrease in other areas if necessary. Um, but uh, Louisiana does not have um, an extreme issue with uh, wait lines. Um, I think the time that we've most had is a, a presidential election uh, where more people participate. So we've increased participation in uh, the congressional midterms. We had over 50% participate in 2018. Uh, in the gubernatorial election, we had over 50% participate. Both of those, um, not record breakers, but records in recent history. Um, and on a presidential year, we tend to have on the national election day around 68 to 70 percent turnout. Uh, as I was speaking this morning, my goal is to promote turnout and let's get to that 70 plus mark and let's get over that 72 percent record that we had way back when Edwin Edwards beat David Duke. I think we can get higher than that and do away with that for good and let the record be a presidential election and, and move forward. Last fall, the part of the state election website that shows voters where their polling place is went down briefly for a couple hours on uh, election day. Is that a broader problem for the United States? <coughs> it's protecting just like the website that shows you where, where to go to vote, uh, and also what's being done in Louisiana to make sure that doesn't happen uh, this year. So that, that issue um, uh, was a um, update that was applied, and for some reason, the translation as it jumped from, and, and I'm not a techie, so um, bear with me, as it jumped from one um, uh, uh, server to another in order to keep it moving and not be um, hacked, if yeah. you will, um, it missed, one of the servers missed the translation, um, and so that's what brought it down. Uh, so we were able to work with our vendor to fix that, that issue. Um, what we have done thus far is that we've created um, other uh, backup sites uh, in order to bring up when, when one goes down. Uh, so that's our goal to, um, to protect from that occurring again. Um, and I think, was there another part of your question that I missed or that, that was it? Level. Oh, at the federal level? I, well, I, don't federal level. I do have a follow-up though. So if you erect a backup site, is it the same URL? And if not, how do you get the information out to the public that this is the new URL where you go to find your voting machine? It, th that original URL will point to another URL. It'll be all done internally. The voter doesn't affect as to where they go. And, and as far as the question about at the federal level, uh, I will say that there are different instances where different things go down for one reason or another. Uh, I'm able to, to do online voter registration in my home state. Uh, and when I went to, to change my affiliation recently, it was down and it didn't say because of maintenance or anything like that. Uh, but even, even when it comes to voter registration database stuff, there are different times where it can go down just because it just got overloaded uh, or it may be something deeper than that. But that just happens in the normal course of business, I think for really any government online presence, whether it's uh, motor vehicle or uh, records or anything like that, um, you know, it, it depends on uh, time, volume, a lot of different factors. So 
I can't say that it's like this widespread issue, just different, different things affect it. Yeah, if I may expand upon that, you know, one prior to my time um, in the office, there were issues with media um, scraping the website to try to get the quickest results that there were possible. And so what we ended up having to do is create a separate um, site just for media and invite them to participate in a direct download of information, uh, which is actually would serve us well if there is an attack on our website during while um, we are populating results on it. Uh, and before we can bring it up, this site will not um, will continuously provide data to um, to the news agencies um, through their process of um, interpreting the raw data and providing it to the to the public. Um, so there would never be an interruption in actual results being shown. Um, the interruption would be until we could get the other site up. But media was actually the problem of scraping it constantly and thus bringing the system down. Uh, some years ago, and which is why we did a multiple process of, of reporting results. Okay, we have one time time for one last question. Uh, yeah, um, do y'all think that partisan, um, like elected officials that run elections, should be elected in partisan elections as a Democrat or a Republican or whatever? No comment from me. Should they be independent? Is what I'm asking. It, it's I think it's a constitutional question of whether or not you're preventing an individual from um, choosing to associate politically with who, which whatever group they want to participate. Uh, certainly there are members of my staff who are election officials uh, who chose uh, to change their affiliation to independent. Um, but I think it's up to the voters to decide whether they want an independent or Republican or a Democrat or no party or whatever. I think that would uh, be a severe constitutional issue that, that would be problematic. Okay, can we get a round of applause for our panel? <laughs> We're going to take a short break now before we head on into our next panel. In just a few minutes, I'm gonna get this panel down and we're gonna have a special presentation for everyone. Um, it's a multimedia musical piece composed by Dr. Jesse Allison and um, performed by Dr. Griffin Campbell. They are both professors here at LSU. And the piece is entitled Critical Mass Media. So if you hang around just a minute, we're gonna start that for you guys.
to try to inject politics in what should be a simple debate about how to pay our bills. And they're stuck in all kinds of issues about abortion, the environment, health care. You know, there, there are times they have those discussions, but that time's not now. Right now, we need to just make sure that we pay our bills and that the government stays open. We have the best jobs in the world we had had in a very long time this past Friday. But you know what? Companies don't like uncertainty, and if they start saying that something we may have to shut down our government, that can halt them out. Right? But we need to build it up. All because of politics. I do not want to see Washington politics stand in the way of America's progress. At a time when you're struggling to pay your bills and meet your responsibilities, the least we can do is meet our bills. Hi everyone, while we're waiting on our panel to get downstairs, can I ask all of you to just move forward please? Close the line. Okay, welcome back everybody. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed Critical Mass Media. Um, before I introduce our final panel, I know there's some new faces in the room, I just wanna give a quick reminder. Restrooms are down the hallway to my right, your left, and we ask that you continue using our hashtags, hashtag Hacking Democracy LSU and hashtag John Bro Symposium. Please make sure your cell phones are silenced. All right, so let's get started with our final panel of the day, the Web Brigades, Russian Troll Farms and Their Impact on U.S. Elections. Um, this panel is gonna be moderated by Manship School doctoral candidate Kirill Branov. He's the self-described Manship School's in-house Russian troll. 
Um, his research focuses on the societal effect of communication technology, particularly how the consumption of information in online environments shapes politically consequential attitudes and beliefs. Joining him on this panel are Josephine Lukito, doctoral candidate at University of Wisconsin-Madison, and Claudia Flores Sabiago. She's a Facebook fellow and doctoral candidate at West Virginia University. Carol, the floor is yours. Keep you here all night. I think it's going. Hello. Hey, thanks for being here. The audience has somewhat scattered towards the end of it, but uh, the more precious is your presence here. So. We will now continue to drive home many points that has been raised during the first panel, inevitably, because Russian trolls has been discussed, have been discussed earlier, and the measures that the government and platforms take to counter them and um, prevent the new wave of malicious activity. I prepared some questions right here. Let me pull them up. So my impression of this whole conversation about uh, meddling and Russian, Russian interference in the U.S. in the workings of the U.S. democracy um, has been going on for a while, but it still lacks uh, common definitions. It still, um, at times, lacks common understanding of what happened, what uh, what exactly we are talking about. Um, there are different terms being thrown around, um, which makes it pretty pretty difficult for the common folk to navigate these muddy waters. And given the disparities in understanding of uh, the subject matter, we had people in the audience who were questioning uh, what the hell a bot was and how it, how it is different from, from a living person. So um, I suggest to start with uh, reaching some common ground with regard to what happened in 2016, uh, what was at the origins of this whole conversation and um, what types of activity were involved in uh, the Russian meddling. So 2016, <laughs> what, what happened? When did it start? When the first signs of uh, some nasty stuff going on surfaced and um, what was the, the original response of the public, of the academics, of uh, all the stakeholders? in the media system. Uh, Joe, would you like to start? Sure. I think um, it's really important when we think about I IRA or Russian disinformation in the U.S. that we need to actually go back a little further um, and think about when the IRA started becoming active. So if I recall correctly, I think they began around 2009, um, and they were not originally targeting the United States. They were actually active in a variety of other countries, particularly those um, within their geographic region, so former Soviet Union countries like Ukraine. Um, and so a lot of their earlier strategies really focused on disinformation in these countries and then, you know, Im they improved on these strategies and then eventually brought them over to the United States and to, you know, situations like Brexit and other countries. Um, and so when I think about Russian disinformation, I actually think about it just historically, you know, how are they inspired from what they did during the Cold War? How did that transform when they started working as the, you know, started developing the Internet Research Agency? And then how did those early strategies in Ukraine and in um, those areas kind of port over into the United States? And I think when we think about it like that, we can start to see these really interesting threads of um, strategies that they employed. So, for example, there's always been, with, with Russia, there's always been a really intimate relationship with news and social media production. And we saw that in Ukraine, for example, um, with the creation of these fake news websites that realistically looked like very real-looking sites. They were very nicely stylized, but if you actually looked more deeply into them, you realize that they were a lot of, it was a lot of disinformation. Um, and in the U.S. context, we actually see some Russian trolls pretending to be, like, U.S. news organizations. So their um, Twitter accounts would be things like Today in uh, Wisconsin or Today in Miami and things mm -hmm. like that, where they were trying to simulate the look of a news organization, but also trying to um, pretend to be, you know, on social media and things like that. Yeah, I agree with that. And that's part of the problem, because American people, or normal citizens, 
have difficulties uh, trying to differentiate what is what is true and what is not, and that's part of uh, part of what has been uh, so successful. Because when they start creating a community, there might be uh, some uh, like Russia people trying to create that community, but also they are attracting people that are really American citizens. So they're trying to engage them in that community, and they are part of the what I saw in my research is that they trying to explain their narrative to them. So meaning that they actually were were doing was explaining them their historical context of something. For example, if they created a, a fake website and they were spreading some time of narrative in that website, they were trying to convince them within the community to believe in that. So that pe that way, people were more prone to to spread the message all over because they really believe in that and that was very powerful. Yeah. And then to kind of put it bring it back to the US, um, in the Mueller report there is some discussion about surveillance done. They had sent some operatives over to the United States to do surveillance and to look at um, activist groups and protest groups and social movements in particular and see what kind of messages were being put out there so that they could simulate them and basically falsify them when they started producing content in the United States. Um, I think there's a little bit of, I, I'm not super clear about when they officially started, like what was the point in which they were like, yes, let's target the United States. Um, but just in terms of data, a lot of the folks have primarily looked at um, Russian disinformation from the United States from kind of 2014 onwards, although it looks like they started around 2012 or 2013. Um, and then it really picked up in obviously around 2015 and 16 with the uh, US presidential election. And then actually um, they got uh, several Russian operatives became even more active after the election. Yeah. Um, and so we actually see an increase in Twitter activity, for example, after the election as opposed to before the election. All right, so there is some background activity going on, going on for some years back. And come 2016, um, before we discuss strategies that were, that were used, um, I would like to, to learn your, your opinion on what do you think of the overall scope and quality of the operation? Because my, um, not very informed, but still uh, opinion is that, well, my impression more like, is that uh, the whole operation at least started as with the attitude of, hey, let's let's see what can we do. Um, it wasn't a strategically planned interference with the democratic process. It was more like, yeah, let's bug them and see uh, what comes out of it. And um, some people who, some marketing and PR professionals who did the audit of this whole online campaign um, actually said that it was a pretty sloppily executed operation and about several, several percent within single digit uh, percent of their posts actually r ever reached any significant audiences. Uh, the amount of money that they paid to um, Facebook for for ads was not impressive at all compared to what people spend in what pe what candidates spend in uh, campaigns, and so there is from one from one hand there is this impression of uh, sloppiness and uh, lack of professionalism, but from the other hand there is uh, this whole talk and this enormous discursive effect that it it had taken. So, um, what do you think about uh, the quality of it and the scope? Well, I think that um, I'm not sure how it started or if it was sloppy or not. What I what I saw from my research is that they actually started to realize they were having certain level of effect. So, for example, in Reddit, they, they started to notice that they could like push content on top of the f front page of Reddit. That uh, th that and, and it got to a point that Reddit had to publicly admit that they have to alter the algorithm because they, w they it, it was constantly happening. So probably what happened is that I started to learn what was their, their reach, what could, what could be reach in, in terms of um, effect. And I think one thing that's quite, maybe not unique anymore, but was unique when Russia started using the Internet Research Agency was their use of social media metrics much in the way that, you know, any advertising, any good advertising campaign is tracking the metrics of your messages. The Russian IRA is also doing the same things for their messages where they're tracking them and seeing what's effective um, and so I imagine that their strategy early on is probably a little bit sloppier than over time they became, you know, much more efficient. They started to pinpoint the certain types of messages that were effective or the certain types of groups that were worth targeting. I think it's also important to remember that Russia is not the only 
um, state-sponsored disinformation campaign. And so if we think about Russia relative to some other countries that employ disinformation tactics, I think Russia is quite sophisticated. If you look at the US dis disinformation campaign, which is called Operation Earnest Voice, um, a lot of the propaganda that the United States tries to push into the Middle East is this very, um, I think it's unsophisticated, uh, pro-American content that they're trying to push into the Middle East and to try and encourage people in the Middle East to think pro-America thoughts. Um, and research has shown that that's not super effective. Um, and so when I think about Russian disinformation strategies relative to some other countries, I think Russia is, is quite sophisticated, certainly now. Kind of makes me proud for my people. <laughs> <sighs> All right, let's, uh, let's talk about some particular things. Uh, what did they do uh, to influence the, the political system? Um, and here, something that um, strikes me as very obvious, but uh, not discussed, not even mentioned a lot, that there, there has been um, very disparate types of activity going on. Uh, here we're, we're talking about troll factories, and um, obviously it is all about pushing some divisive narratives and uh, impersonating domestic political actors. But also, parallel to that, we had hacks of DNC emails and hack and leak operations, and um, some um, narrative, narrative washing operations um, going on even without any regard to, to elections, just some regular stuff that uh, the intelligence does from from good old KGB days. So um, I think it's important to make this conceptual distinction at least between trolling and hacking mm -hmm. because those those two terms are um, perhaps the most widely used. So uh, yeah, in my understanding, uh, there is a sep there's a, a wall between uh, trolling, impersonating um, domestic political actors and pushing narratives to the public in order to sway public opinion or sow discord. And there is also uh, hacking, which is managed and overseen by uh, by a different entity. Presumably it is uh, directly the uh, GRU, the, uh, the Russian Military Intelligence Directorate, as opposed to the troll factory, which is not, which does not have any official ties uh, to the government. Mm -hmm. So how, how correct uh, and how, um, is, is this understanding nuanced enough to, to make sense out of what I what do think on? that trolling and hacking are two different types of activities, right? And so when I talk about trolling or when we talk about trolling, it's usually um, a human who is producing inflammatory content. Sometimes the information is false um, and then kind of sending it now traditionally over social media. Um, and when we talk about hacking, we're really talking about um, unauthorized access into someone else's technology, um, whether that's content or whether that's um, getting information or something like that. And obviously, I, I think we think of these strategies as different, but I think they're also related in some way. And certainly, I think they're used together to survey a broader strategic goal. Um, so for example, the DNC hacking uh, that occurred, when it occurred, it looked like um, temporally speaking, there was a lot more Russian disinformation activity going on just as the um, DNC uh, emails and cables were leaked. And so we, I, temporally there's some evidence to show that the hacking attempts were in some way coordinated with disinformation that was produced subsequently. I agree. I mean, in, in the sense if you are um, ha having a hacking activity, but at the same time, you are kind of coordinating some people that are pro that hacking activity. It's obviously they're going to entangle together mm -hmm. in the sense that it, because I am pro hacking activities, I'm going to leak that information. I'm going to spread it all over social media. So even if they're separate, they're going to come together I'm gonna at some point. Yeah. And I'm going to throw two more um, kind of strategies that are still related. And I think, again, it's important to remember that a lot of these strategies are coordinated to serve some sort of strategic foreign policy goal. Um, so the first one is bot activity. We've talked a little bit about that. And one of the main distinguishing features of bots and trolls is that trolls are typically humans, whereas bots are automated activity. There's a bit of blending um, with these certain types of accounts called cyborgs that are partially automated and partially run by humans. Um, but 
when we talk about just trolls and just bots specifically, we find that bot activity tends to amplify or retweet the troll activity. That way, a bot can't necessarily be identifiable by having um, kind of automated looking type content. They're actually just retweeting content that's created by real people. The second uh, strategy that I wanted to emphasize is um, kind of white propaganda or public diplomacy or um, uh, international broadcasting or news organizations that are controlled or sponsored or owned by a government. Um, and in the case of Russia, I'm really talking about Russia today. Um, and so Russia Today, for those of you who are not familiar, is a news organization um, that is sponsored or owned or controlled by Russia to generally promote um, pro-Russian information and news. And it's common knowledge that Russia Today, or RT as they're called now, is controlled by Russia. And you know, again, Russia is not the only country that's doing this. The United States has Voice of America, um, China Daily, so on and so forth. But one of the things that we find is that Russian disinformation tends to share or include links that are from Russia today. And so they tend to amplify news stories that are coming from this kind of um, white propaganda, more open strategy. So they're, I think they're all coordinated and linked, um, and again, serving some sort of strategic goal. So what you're saying is that essentially all those strings of activity are centrally coordinated and there is a synergy between them going on? I don't know if I'd say, I, I don't have any proof to say that they're necessarily centrally organized or that there's kind of one person who's controlling it all, but I think that these strategies are probably very aware of one another um, and do benefit from different types of strategies. So if there's a hacking strategy and then a bunch of emails are leaked, I think when uh, the IRA sees that, they know that they can take advantage of that to send more disinformation out, for example. All right. Um, so I guess we we have some initial understanding uh, of the of what what it was structurally 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 excuse me. Um, let's now talk about the um, the effects on the American public discourse and on social groups, uh, online groups who picked up the message, who carried it, and who amplified amplified it manifold. So in the good old KGB days, there was a um, there was a term useful idiots uh, by which the uh, Soviet intelligence referred to um, to foreign people, usually foreign public figures, um, who are out of the goodness of their hearts, uh, amplifying the Soviet message within their respective countries because either they were left-leaning or socialist symp sympathizers or they would just carry anything that, that's anti-government uh, anti, uh, domestically. Um, and um, those were widely used to uh, to spread the narratives that uh, the Soviet intelligence wanted to spread. Um, who are the useful idiots of of today, of 2016, 2018, 20, 2020? Um, I guess this is this is a question for you, uh, Claudia, first and foremost, because you study um, online communities on Reddit and elsewhere. So, um, which groups, which particular groups? Uh, picked up the the trolls message, um, and I'm talking about the U.S. the uh, the domestic groups, and were instrumental in promoting those, uh, propagating those narratives. Do you mean who are f who were affected or who promoted those messages? Because uh, I mean the, the general public was affected by that, and but the main issue was that they were creating division, and this division was causing that they alienated from social media conversations like were like neutral conversations. So these these trolls or these political trolls, what what was happening is that they were creating such a contaminated like uh, like environment on social media that people that regular citizens prefer not to participate anymore, and that's that's. Part of what I want to say in the in the first panel, in in, in the sense that it's created an information void, meaning that neutral uh, conversations are not happening anymore, and these extreme voices are the ones that are, are like are participating more and more because of these reasons. I do think too, um, and I I completely agree with Claudia's statement. I think there's a really interesting. Um, asymmetry, particularly among kind of the conservative communication ecology versus the liberal communication ecology. And I think one of those reasons, um, there's been other kind of literature looking at partisan political communication showing that the conservative 
media ecology is very coordinated and very strategic and very um, interlinked with one another. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that this information spreads faster when a network is much more closely tied to one another. Um, and there's been research showing that uh, disinform Russian disinformation spread more quickly in these, commun uh, these conservative media ecologies relative to the liberal media ecologies. And what I found in my research is that Russian trolls were cited more in conservative news media relative to liberal or mainstream news media outlets. Um, I really hesitate to use the term, a term like useful idiots because I think we're all prone to being useful idiots. Uh, we're, and this is I think just true generally, Russia is really smart about knowing that we are all just exhausted in this communication e ecology. There's a lot of information that is, that we're, you know, we're consuming and I think audiences and journalists too are, have to struggle with how do we make conscious decisions about what information to trust and what information not to trust. And I think Russia is certainly taking advantage of that. Good. <laughs> Very good. I think it's time to, um, I mean, uh, in terms of our discussion, not in terms of the state of affairs, of course. Um, next up is today, 2020. Um, I personally noticed a few, well, I noticed a lot of media reports of how everybody is getting prepared for the new wave of um, interference. And I have seen much less actual reporting on um, activities going on. One thing I do remember is, what is um, it was September, October, Facebook reported taking down a um, network of inauthentic accounts allegedly uh, linked to, uh, to Russian operatives on Instagram. Um, yeah, so let's, let's talk about uh, the ongoing, ongoing activity, how intense uh, it is, and um, whether it's in, in any way different from what we observed four years ago. Actually, I, I, ha I don't think that it's going like, like it's going to be, it's going to diminish. Actually, I think they're learning more and they're learning how to game the system in a way in the sense that even though that social media platforms are doing whatever they can to try to stop them, uh, it's really hard for, um, for artificial intelligence or machine learning system to detect this type of activity like immediately. That's why uh, all these social media platforms ha have uh, not only AI but also content moderations. But even that, even, even that it's not enough because how fast how fast it spreads. So I don't think that it's going to diminish. And I'm gonna point to kind of two strategies that um, research has shown they've been employing more post-2016 to point to Claudia's argument. Um, so the first one is the development or use of more complex media personalities. So in the last panel, I talked a little bit about some accounts that had, there were, most accounts just had one platform, but there were, very, there were a few accounts that had, say, a blog and a Twitter page and a Facebook page and an email account. Um, I think in 2020, we'll probably see a lot more of those types of media personas where they have multiple social media platforms or an email link um, that makes it look like online they have a more complex or realistic looking persona. The second strategy that I have seen in research that people have been pointing to is that the IRA has been hiring Americans to produce disinformation. Um, and I personally haven't studied this, but I am very concerned about how we would be able to identify that given that a lot of our previous strategies, so for example, the ones that I was talking about before, were really focused on looking at, for example, Russian speakers trying to speaking in English. That's a lot harder to use or rely on if you know the IRA is paying Americans to produce disinformation. Also, the use on of encrypted platforms. Oh yeah. So right now, it like because of privacy, a lot of um, companies are pro encrypted platforms, so they're trying. But but also, this type of personas mm -hmm. are using those platforms to spread misinformation. How about TikTok? Is TikTok a threat? <laughs> 
TikTok's so interesting. TikTok's so interesting for a lot of reasons, right? Because they're a Chinese-owned company, and so there's been reports about disinformation coming from China in particular. And I think you know TikTok as a as a Chinese social media platform is potentially ripe for disinformation um, related to that. I I personally don't have proof that Russia is utilizing TikTok, but that would not surprise me given that Russia is active on every other U.S. social media platform. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised either. Yeah, and I think one of the really interesting things about TikTok is that um, a lot of the content that I've studied thus far has really focused on text, but TikTok is obviously not that, right? It's images, it's visuals. Um, and as I think we're seeing, there's been a lot of scary advancements of disinformation that is more oriented towards images and deep fakes and mm -hmm. false image or false videos and that sort of thing and i imagine that again tiktok would be a great platform to test drive those messages scary stuff uh oh um are we now are you now better prepared for uh for what's about to happen so obviously policymakers are alert some part of public is alert, um, platforms are doing what they can to, to hold uh, the known activities, the no known types of malicious activity. Um, does it mean that mm, these defenses are sufficient or efficient against what's, what's coming? No, I don't think so. And uh, one problem that it's really what really hard problem is content moderation mm -hmm. because content moderation it's not only doing by AI but it's do it's been doing it's been done by humans so if you recruit uh, like uh, hundreds of humans and you give them like certain they, they have like these books of policies of what's allowed and what it's not allowed the, there's still a lot of that that can be misinterpreted by them so some of them th cannot even agree what's allowed in what platform, what's not allowed in what platform. So, and, and it's human judgment. So I, I remember that I was in Washington DC in an event about content moderation, and they made this like exercise with the public, uh, so that us, and they say, they put like this tweet uh, on, the, on the screen, and they say, if you were like a content moderator, would you put down that tweet? And everybody was the, everybody said yes, and they 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 unhide the picture of who tweeted that, and it was the president. So everybody was doubt about if they would put it down or not. So that type of judgment is what complicates things. Yeah, and like and then when you think about machine learning and artificial intelligence, a lot of the ways in which supervised machine learning algorithms are constructed is using human labeled data sets, yeah, and so a human will produce. Uh, will code a thousand messages, for example, and say some of these, like you know, 500 are um, should be pulled down and 500 should be maintained, and that is the information that we feed into an algorithm that then you know is then employed to study the rest of the 10 million messages that are produced. If the um, people who are producing those labeled data sets are unsure about their decision-making process, that feeds into the algorithm, which then also isn't particular might not be particularly good at identifying content we want versus content we don't want. Another thing I think is really hard is that we're kind of chasing one another. Mm -hmm. And this is also true of you know bot detection. Anytime someone develops a really cool bot detection tool like Botometer or whatever, the person who is creating a bot will develop strategies that make it harder to identify those bots. And I think the same thing is also true of disinformation. Anytime we find a technique or a strategy that has been employed, um, Russia or any other you know, state actor or political group can likely think of strategies that circumvent the techniques that we've identified. And so I think that is kind of always going to be a chase against one another, and that's probably not going to go away you know, even after 2020 into 2030, you know, six and forward. Is there any evidence of um, Russian trolls utilizing those known uh, flaws in platform governance, those unresolved issues with moderation? Um, is there any evidence that they are consciously pushing and pressing those hot buttons? Or does it happen more naturally as a result of large scale testing? Do they, do they test what they do? My, a, B, my C, research works? shows that there's possibly some testing. And um, as I mentioned, it seems like a lot of that test driving is occurring on Reddit and then being ported onto yeah. Twitter, which I think is a 
pretty clever strategy um, if you're going to test drive a message in a smaller market and then employ it in the larger market. Um, certainly, I think one of the things that Russian disinformation actors are trying to take advantage of are um, algorithmic biases or ways in which um, social media use algorithms to populate feeds. And so if, for example, a news feed is populated or, uh, sorry, if a uh, post is higher on or uh, appears frequently on a news feed because there's a lot of comments underneath it, and we know if that's a strategy, that's something that Russian disinformation actors can take advantage of, for example, right? They'll just comment on each other's posts a lot and that'll drive it up in the newsfeed or using bots to retweet a lot of messages so that other people see it. Um, and so I think we do see some sort of strategic, um, I don't know if I'd say manipulation, but use of what we know about algorithms. But again, I don't think it's just Russian disinformation actors that are doing this. Most political groups, advertising campaigns, they're all you know, trying to, to game the algorithm so that we see their messages. Yeah, it's something that happens uh, all over the world. I mean, we, I saw the same in Mexico and they were not Russian hackers, they were just political parties that were trying to game the system. I mean, to trying to game the platform algorithm mm -hmm. to try to push the message, so I think it's gonna happen. Yeah, yeah. and I, I would say that one of the platforms that I haven't studied but really want to study and I'm extra concerned about is WhatsApp. Um, and so WhatsApp is quite unique compared to some other platforms mm -hmm. that we've talked about like Twitter and Reddit where m a lot of things are very public and kind of relatively easy to access. By comparison, WhatsApp is very focused on these kind of group networks where you join a specific group and um, they share news information through that. And so it's not as public or open. Mm -hmm. And so it's much harder to find disinformation um, or to track disinformation or misinformation through WhatsApp compared to Twitter or, or Reddit or even Facebook. Only if you have access to those groups, you're exactly. gonna have them. Yeah. yeah. And the problem, is, for example, in Latin America happens a lot that it those it, WhatsApp is very popular all over Latin America because of tech companies give you WhatsApp for free, WhatsApp data, f data for free. So we, uh, I, I, in my research, I did some studies during a crisis event that was an earthquake in Mexico. And what we found is that a lot of the misinformation was circulating on WhatsApp groups that were from family members that were like, trying to, to know what was happening with, the, with their relatives. And we see this also in Indonesia, in yeah. Pakistan, in India, and so a lot of countries that do rely on WhatsApp are struggling in dealing with disinformation in a very unique and, and difficult way compared to the United States, just based off kind of the social media platforms themselves and the dynamics within them. Mm -hmm. One theme that comes up pretty consistently in this conversation is that there is something universal, universal about those strategies um, and um, about th those vulnerabilities of um, the digital public sphere. Um, so Russian trolls are just probably the most conspicuous actors who take advantage of that, but it happens um, across national contexts and across uh, media systems and across various types of actors with the various kinds of motivations. So what would be some general takeaways that we can some general lessons that we can learn from, from this whole uh, Madeline affair. What does it tell us um, about the nature of digital political discourse? So I think one of the really big messages that people were, were you know, espousing when the internet became a thing was that this would democratize information and everyone would be able to connect with one another in um, unique ways and this idea that um, you're the ability to create an audience has been, been democratized. Anyone can do that. However, when we when we try to when we think about that relative to the power structure and just you know the international system, we know that states are not going to relinquish that the level of power that they have. And so, strategies that regular people can do to develop audiences, states can also do um, to build audiences or to serve certain strategic goals. And I think disinformation needs to be understood in the in that kind of historic context of propaganda historically and of strategies that were employed in the colonial era and exactly. during the Cold War. Exactly, I mean, misinformation has always been there. The only problem is that social media platforms amplify that. Mm -hmm. And definitely, I think there's a really fascinating link between dis and misinformation production mm -hmm. and surveillance. Um, and so, for example, one of the strategies that the United States employed while they were um, colonizing the Philippines was to actually surveil revolutionaries in the Philippines in order to um, spread disinformation 
in, their, in, in the Philippines at the time and to squash those revolutionary strategies. Some of those strategies they ported into the United States. Um, and so even historically, there's always been this very intimate link between surveillance and disinformation production, where you are producing disinformation based off your knowledge of what's being surveilled. What does it tell us about the U.S. political system in particular? What's, what sorts of uh, revelations can we draw from, uh, from the Russian trolls trying to influence the U.S. democracy? Um, apart from probably obvious things like how polarized the society is and uh, how extreme the discourse is, uh, maybe there are, are there any more subtle observations that we can make with regard to what is American public sphere today? Probably that we believe that people are now more aware of it, uh, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't affect them. It just means that they are going to be more doubtful about what they read, and they will not be, uh, they, were, they won't know what to trust, and that's a problem. It is a problem, and I think that makes me just like a very sad researcher when I think about that. <laughs> you know, I, there's oftentimes I'm on social media and I'm talking about disinformation and misinformation or Russian trolls, and I worry about whether me talking about it makes people more skeptical yeah. about the public sphere. And so, for example, as I mentioned previously, um, when political elites talk about Russian trolls, there's an increased amount of people on Twitter pointing at one another saying, you are a Russian troll, mm -hmm. immediately after the kind of political elite has promoted that rhetoric or that message. And um, those sort of dynamics really worry me. My hope, and I, I want to have a lot of faith in people and people's willingness to engage with one another in the public sphere. And so I like to think that even with all of this disinformation or misinformation, I still try to encourage people to talk to one another on social media, even if you are skeptical of that person or you think that person is disingenuous, I think it's still important to, to want to engage with the public. Maybe that's overly optimistic, but I, some part of me wants to be hopeful that that's true. All right, I guess we can open up the floor to questions, if there are any. I'm um, curious about whether there's, uh, from a policy perspective, any aspect to the idea of resilience around any of this, um, whether there's uh, either pulling on civil society NGO groups to provide um, or back up the validity of information or if there's lessons learned from uh, what the Russians have done in Eastern Europe that might be pulled into domestic policy. I didn't hear the last end of that, sorry. I heard Eastern Europe. Uh, sorry, curious about domestic policy and whether we could pull lessons learned from um, what Russians have done in other states. Policy recommendations. So I, my, my dream would be if states just stopped using this like troll armies altogether. I know that's probably not gonna be the case because again, the US has their own troll army and at this point, um, there's research coming out of Oxford that shows that 70 countries have some sort of computational propaganda strategy, whether it's the use of bots or trolls or hacking some comedy or some combination of all three. Um, ideally, I would love if the UN would push more on stopping those processes and trying to discourage countries from engaging in them. Um, I'm not super optimistic of that, but I would hope that they're moving in that direction. No, I have to think I a little bit about that question. I agree. I mean, the problem is not that they created this massive number of, of fake accounts. And do, uh, the problem is what they're doing with those accounts. I mean, the problem is activity, not what they, yeah, if I they use the platform. Because the platforms, the, it's, it's, like, it's like a cat-mouse mm -hmm. kind of game. The platforms are going to get better in some things. For example, the development of AI, it's going to get better. But then the ones, that I the ones that are using AI to create deep fakes and spread the message, that's the problem. And I think it's hard for the U.S. to point at Russia and say, stop doing this, mm -hmm. when you know, Russia will say right back, you, know, you are also doing this. Um, it's, it's very difficult in the international system. So I'm not sure exactly how to frame this question, but it strikes me that w one of the weird communication issues here is that we talk about Russian troll farms, and there's so many and uh, uh, there's so many threats in the world, you know, military state threats, you know, where we'll talk about, you know, 
some big broad concept, um, you know, ISIS, you know, whatever. But but we'll also talk about like specific leaders of those organizations, you know. I d and I don't feel like I ever hear much about like who the trolls are and who, you know who's the who's the field commander of you know the troll army and and that sort of thing. And I'm wondering, um, I, I just th there are kind of two speculative things here. Well, one is you know, maybe just descriptively and narratively, if, if, if you could kind of lift under the hood and kind of talk a little bit about who are the field commanders and, you know, th that, that just descriptively there. And then also sort of speculate against this, um, this notion of would we think about this differently? Would we have a different kind of collective conversation about the threat of uh, interference if, if, we, if this was more personalized, if we talked about, like, the leader of the troll farms, you know, because obviously it's not like Putin is sitting at his computer, you know, doing this. There's there's a, a bureaucratic apparatus that that does this, but we don't hear much about that or talk about that much, and and we get at least the top of the trees on that with other threats. And I'm I'm, I'm wondering if you could speculate to to that phenomenon. Actually, there have been, so to say, ethnographies of uh, the troll factory. Uh, I know at least one in the U.S. media. Um, the New York Times journalists, uh, he interviewed several of them and he tried to, to show the humane perspective. It was back in 2016 or in 15. And uh, in Russian investigative media, there have been a few uh, pretty big stories. Once a journalist uh, penetrated the factory, actually got hired and spent a few days working um, there and reported on how it all works from the inside. So I guess uh, one of the issues here is that it's just the, the language and the cultural barrier because uh, back in Mother Russia, there is, at least among the interesting people, there is a pretty good understanding who those kids are. Uh, usually the, the, the foot soldiers are um, young people from the, from the remote regions who come to St. Petersburg uh, in search for, for a job and the pay is decent and it's better than working for some uh, state-sponsored outlet just cranking out plain propaganda. It's at least uh, it has some some uh, adventurous allure to it. And we are the foreign operation. Uh, we are the shield. <laughs> um, so and I, I'll point, in terms of like kind of who's at the head of it, I point you to the indict Mueller's indictment of those 13 Russians and I think it was yeah, three Russian companies. Um, and I think those are kind of the, the folks that Mueller has targeted as kind of top of the chain. Um, just strategically, uh, um, as Carol has mentioned, is that, am I pronouncing that correctly? No, it's pretty close. Okay. <laughs> You're doing um, good. I think there's been a lot of really fascinating ethnographic work about the, the strategies behind them. So we know that, for example, when a person is hired to be a Russian troll, they tend to work in shifts of either eight hours or 12 hours where they are expected, they have a quota and are expected to produce information, say like a certain number of messages in that eight hour or 12, 12 hour time span. Um, and interviews with former Russian trolls have mentioned that it's quite grueling and quite exhausting to actually produce the sheer amount of content that they are expected to produce. Um, and every day they get an email or a notice from uh, a higher up to tell them what kind of information to produce. And so they're also told you know, what content to produce. Um, there's been some information about kind of a separate department that's for producing memes and um, kind of more visual content. And so we know internally that seems to be some sort of strategic construction of departments or groups that are more oriented towards producing certain kind of messages. Um, and then of course the IRA is, as I mentioned, not only active in the United States, but active in the UK or active in Ukraine. And um, domestically as well. And domestically, thank you. Um, and that's a really great point because one of the things about Russia is that they can deploy those strategies first in Russia and then experiment with what is most effective. Um, and there's uh, some folks have sh shown that uh, these groups are kind of working in individual teams. Mm -hmm. So the, um, I believe the US one, the US team is called Translation Project, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but that there was like a, an unofficial term or official term um, for that particular group. So it seems like there's these kind of teams that are specifically focused on, say, the US case or the UK case. Hopefully that's an interesting. Infor I think of it a lot as like, um, to your point, I think of it a lot as like the office, <laughs> but producing <laughs> disinformation. These are not people who are like 
you know, hate the U.S. and I'm here to produce disinformation. Like these are folks who are looking for money, and the IRA pays super well. Um, and you have to sit there and what be on on Twitter or on social media or live journal um, and produce content. And they're not people who are invested necessarily in like taking down the United States or any of these other countries. And so I. I in my mind, I think of like a fan fiction of the IRA, but like an office form where it's just like people who are around <laughs> who are like, instead of selling paper, they're sowing disinformation. Yeah, job ads usually read something like SMM manager wanted. Um, and yeah, they, they do, from what I know, they do have departments and those people who, who have at least some decent English uh, get more money because they, they work for the international in the international department, but there are also trolls who, who work domestically, who usually are employed to flood um, oppositional YouTube channels, comment feeds with uh, with a bunch of nonsense, and yeah, they do receive their talking points um, every once in a while. And there are there are officers who are allegedly more knowledgeable about the discourse, the issues, the what they should say and what they should articulate. Um, yeah, so there is definitely some division of labor. There is some organizational structure, and um, yeah, and the, the office. Oh, sorry, and and different states use different strategies. So I'll just use again. Sorry for using the U.S. repeatedly, but it's a fascinating case. Um, so Operation Earnest Voice, the U.S. has actually paid a third party um, company to produce those social media messages, and so it's not the U.S. that is really constructing this organization, but they've basically outsourced disinformation to another company. Uh, I was just going to ask, whenever you mentioned like the Mueller report and you talked about, uh, I want to I I say you used three of like their uh, like actual farms that like employ other people and stuff like that. Are they related to the actual like uh, whenever it comes to like Russian bots and stuff like that, are they related to actual government itself or are they just an individual kind of company that's separate from the government? So would you like to take it? Um, yeah, so lots of lots of um, pro-government activity in in Russia occurs uh, informally. So you don't have to be a governmental employee to to do something for the good of uh, uh, Vlad. <laughs> and um, in this particular case, uh, and it it is not only related to um, informational operations. Lots of Putin's friends own businesses. Um, that are related to oil or some kind of natural resources extraction or infrastructure objects or uh, so a lot of a lot of that is privatized. That's what we call olig the oligarchs. The oligarchy is still um, big, and so um, one one particular person who is related, who is believed, and there is a lot of evidence pointing to that he is at the helm of this thing. Is his name is Evgeny Prigozhin. He is. Um, He's known as Putin's cook because his association with Put Putin started when he uh, provided c catering services to one of the St. Petersburg administration's uh, dinners back back when Putin was in St. Petersburg administration as a vice mayor. Um, and so, and th this guy now runs the troll factory, uh, but also he runs a military private military company which is active in Syria and now in Africa and in Libya. So. Uh, this is how it's done. You don't have to be associated with the government uh, to act on behalf of the president of the or the national interest. Um. Yeah, and the structure is, is exactly like not entirely formal where you know that this person is paying this person. It's a very informal relational um, network. Yeah, that that's what makes it harder to track and to, to justify in court, say to, to indict people or organizations because Putin, uh, in multiple interviews, he would just go and say, when asked, directly uh what about this person well yeah i know him but well he's a businessman yeah i i met him once or twice um i don't know ab about any of his illicit activity so that's he, he definitely doesn't do anything for me and at least in terms of rhetoric it's easy to dismiss it like that because there is no official connection well Russian intelligence isn't uh, controlling all this? Uh, we do not know that because it's so clandestine. Uh, we don't know, we, don't, we uh, can be reasonably sure that uh, Russian intelligence was behind um, several high profile hackings, hack and leak operations. And that goes back to the distinction between hacking and trolling. So, uh, speaking of these terms, 
trolling is more the IRAs department, which is unofficial department, whereas uh, hacking operations are can be traced uh, relatively certainly to uh, to Russian military intelligence. But we do not know how much of cooperation and coordination occurs between those different actors. Perhaps a lot, but there is nothing we can say for sure. Yeah, we'd have to interview those operatives. That, that like, you know, I, I wouldn't be convinced just saying it myself until I heard it from someone that's like, yes, these are strategically linked. Um, and I think it's to their advantage that these strategies are coordinated, certainly. Um, so I would imagine they would be just for their strategic benefit, but I don't have any tangible proof of that. Hi, uh, Catherine Hall Jamison, a fairly prominent political scientist. You probably know her thesis. Great book. I look at the I look at the title on our screen. Is she right? Did uh, did WikiLeaks in the last days of the 2016 campaign tip the election outcome t in favor of Donald Trump? She believes, that she believes the data shows that it did, and. Do you agree? What a good and hard question. Um, I think, so one of the really fascinating things I have found about that particular day, like the release of the DNC emails, was that it really coincided, if you recall, with Trump's Access Hollywood um, video. And so I think it happened like within a day of each other, if not on the same day. Oh, oh sorry. Hour, yes, within yeah. hours of each other. Um, and like if you're trying, so, when we tracked Twitter activity of um, the United States election, we saw this in that hour, couple hour time span, or I think we looked at, at the 24 hours of that day, um, a very clear shift from talking about Access Hollywood to talking about the DNC hacks. Um, whether I could point to it and say that this is definitively what tipped the election, I wouldn't be confident enough to say that, but I certainly think just in terms of discourse on Twitter, um, there's some proof that there's at least the attention shifted from one story to another. Yeah, I'm talking about the last days of the election. It, it was more than just the, uh, the minutes after Access Hollywood. If you go back and look at the last days of October yeah. and the trickle of, of leaks that were orchestrated by, by Julian Assange, mm -hmm. she argues that it, in key states it tips undecided voters. Have you studied that? Do you know if that's true? I don't want to, I, I haven't personally studied it. I also, again, I would hesitate to say one single story or one single issue really tipped the scales. I do think that um, there's proof that Russian IRA activity increased after that time and um, from, you know, through October into the election and then after the election. And so certainly I think, you know, when those DNC emails were leaked, it's something that disinformation actors could have taken advantage of. Whether that ultimately really tipped the scales in those last few days, I don't have empirical proof for. And nobody ever will. No. <laughs> okay, I think this is going to be our last question. Um, whenever it comes to kind of like a like agendas for like these farms and stuff like that, and what their purpose in actually doing like an actual like a like a troll or something like that. Do we have, or do we know of any like um, like trends whenever it comes to like their agendas and stuff like that? Is it just to spread misinformation, or is it for a sp like like would a trend be for like a certain political candidate, or maybe like a certain like ideology or a certain um, like story or perspective that they have? Do we have any kind of like trends as of that kind of stuff? Actually, yes. I mean, the, the, uh, the community that I started, it was really pro-Trump. So they, part of the message that they said the community is that they, they wanted Donald Trump to be elected. So that's why, that was their mission. So everything was around that. And yeah, so it was more about the spreading everything that was anti-Hillary and created memes anti-Hillary, all the libraries that they created, they had a purpose, and that was the purpose. I mean, it's hard to measure a causal effect. I mean, you cannot say that that's because that's why he won, but you can certainly say that they had a mission, and that was the mission. And the Mueller report notes that there's these kind of short-term strategies, again, focusing on supporting Trump and Sanders and disparaging Clinton, and then more long-term strategies of just generally sowing discord. And so. Uh, 
I think when we think about the IRA, we have to think about it in these kind of like short term goals and long term goals. Mm -hmm. uh, one platform that I think would be really interesting for your question in terms of trends is um, it's called the Securing Democracy Hamilton 68 dashboard. And it's a dashboard um, from a, I think it's a think tank, um, but they track several accounts, social media, Twitter accounts that they say are attached to Russia. I don't know what the method behind them is, so I can't say with certainty that they are related to the IRA or not, um, but that live dashboard does track um, content that they say comes from disinformation actors from Russia. So that'd be a really interesting platform to explore that question. All right, do we have, we can do one more question? Are there any more questions? Okay. Answered everything you ever wanted to know about Russian hacking and Russian trolls. <laughs> I learned so much today. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you all for, for coming today and for staying for the entire uh, program. My name is Janae Slocum. I'm the director of the Riley Center for Media and Public Affairs. Uh, it's the Riley Center that helped to put this together. Uh, the John Bro Symposium is an annual event that we put on. Um, and, and its main purpose is to look at an issue in media and politics that needs, uh, well, you're the second person that, that happened to you today. <laughs> 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 um, but uh, to, to bring greater awareness and analysis, it's, it's both, it's awareness and analysis to um, important issues. And I hope that uh, you'll continue to think about these things. These are questions that are going to endure. Um, and I think as we talked about th throughout the day, uh, uh, the technology has changed, um, kind of how these same things happen, but these are things that have been happening um, throughout time, or at least uh, throughout civilization. Um, so, well, first of all, I, or not first of all, but I would like to thank our, um, our guests. Uh, our, some of our guests are up there. Thank you for coming in, um, and I'd also like to uh, thank uh, Lance Porter for um, really helping to bring this <laughs> together. Um, and uh, Lance is going to be editing a, an edited volume that will come out of this. Uh, the individuals that were on that first panel are all contributing uh, to, that, uh, to that book. Um, it'll be out in about a year and a half. <laughs> Um, but it, it, it's going to be fascinating. Um, and I'd also like to thank the Riley Center staff and our volunteers for helping to make this happen. Yes, please. Uh, doing something like this involves uh, organizing travel for, you know, a dozen people, uh, making sure that they get here on time and that we've got uh, everything that we need for the production. So it's a, a really big undertaking. And so if we could do one more round of applause for <laughs> our staff. Well, thank you again. Uh, you know, enjoy the rest of your evening. And we hope to see you again at another uh, Manship School Riley Center event. Thank you. <laughs>